ODI World Tour rolled into Adelaide for the Santos Tour Down Under. And it was two-time winner Andre Greipel who kicked off the event in explosive fashion. Andre Greipel, third time he has won this opening race. The stages have changed, but the goals are the same. And the riders are more excited than ever. There's been a few changes this year to this course, so if anything, I probably like it better than the previous season since Tour Down Under. This year provides for a bit more you know, attacking style riding. This is an important race for us. We have a we have a pretty strong team. We've got a good bunch of guys here, and hopefully the knowledge I have will uh, will help. We have a well-rounded team. I'm really looking forward to racing with these guys. I believe we have a three, four guys who really can finish on the podium here. I'm confident we've got a great team here, so I'm uh, really looking forward to it. It's the first stage of the 2013 Santos Tour Down Under, and it's going to be a thriller. Somebody's gone down in the middle. Feel the rush and hear the purr of wheels in motion. Goss is clear and Greipel is on his wheel. Cameron Meyer at 23 years of age. Feel the rush as colours blur and wheels in motion. They've got him one, two on the line. Wheels in Hello and welcome to Channel 9's Wide World of Sports. Does the picture get any better than that? The L'Oreal Men Expert Stage 1 of the Santos Tour Down Under. We are in the Adelaide Hills. The weather is glorious. Postcard picture perfect. It's weather at 23 degrees. Beautiful. Just a slight breeze and gorgeous here in the Adelaide Hills for Stage 1. Joining us, of course, today, the voices of the Santos Tour Down Under, Phil Liggett and Paul Sherwin. Gentlemen, how are we? Very well. It's a perfect day for the bike race. It's the opening of the World Tour. All the best teams in the world are here and they will be so relieved that they're not in the oven. This is perfect temperatures. Ideal. I think only one thing that might make the race a little bit more difficult and very often the rider's enemy is the wind because there's quite a breeze coming in mm -hmm. and when they go for the two finishing circuits around Lobenthal here this afternoon, we might see some good action. All right, now the race is underway and already mm -hmm. a landmark moment for Jordan Kirby, a young Australian who uh, already has something that no one can take off him. Yeah, he's just calling for a drink here at the moment. Uh, these are live pictures coming in. He's out on the course. He got away soon after the start. He's been out front now for quite a while and he's built a lead of over seven minutes. I think the reaction is coming now. He's talking to his team car. He's, it's, he's one of the, he's the amateur national team, if you like, not amateur, but professional national team uh, for, sponsored by UniSA. He's the under-23 national road race champion, Paul. His season really is beginning this year, isn't it? It certainly is, but when we look back at the main field, we can start to see that the uh, big professional teams here are beginning to take a serious interest in the advantage of the young Australian because you've got the two teams of the two big sprinters in the Santos Tour down under at the front, Argos Shimano for the German rider Kittel, and also right behind them, the team Lotto Belisol, they're thinking about stage victory, stage number one for Andre Greipel. That's why they're doing all of this pacemaking. Yeah, and the thing about Andre Greipel, of course, it would be his 12th stage win. He'd equal Robbie McEwen. He's already won the Classic. He did the Classic and stage one last year. But just quickly on Jordan Kirby before we have a look in the rearview mirror, he's already got the king of the mountain for this one. Yes, he's gone over the only climb of the day at Checker Hill already. It came after 42 kilometres of the stage today. Well clear of the field, so he'll pull on the Skoda, king of the mountain, Mountains green spotted jersey of tomorrow. So it wasn't a bad idea to attack, was it? No, it wasn't at all. Proud moment for him and his yeah. family. Big year ahead, of course, for Jordan Kirby. We had a wonderful night the other night, over 108,000 people for the People's Choice Classic. Andre Greipel won it. Let's have a look how it all unfolded. Ready? Well, they are away, and I tell you what, uh, what, what interesting thing about this race here, uh, the People's Choice Classic and the Santos Tour Down Under, although it's part of the World Tour, they've always allowed a young Australian team in as a development squad, and it's uh, Uni SA, the squad, all Australian riders, and they are always very aggressive, Phil. They're quite keen to take a few scalps. Well, I think I'm wrong on this occasion because I think one of the first riders to go onto the <laughs> attack else? is one of the oldest riders in the field at 41 years of age. It's Jens Voigt from Germany. Voigt on the attack for Team Radio Shack. He's got somebody with him down there, but it looks like he might have a UniSA rider with him, and I think he has. I think it's Zach Dempster who's gone with him there. Now 
Coming as we're out onto lap 21, we're nine laps from the finish. They refuse to give up. Zach looks over his shoulder, little grimace on his face, and he thinks, oh, they're here. The black jerseys of Sky are trying to move into position. The Lotto Bellasol team have done it all right so far. They've got control of the peloton. They've pushed the Odica Green Edge away from it. And Andre Greipel, who's won this race twice already, is the fifth man in the line of those jerseys. He is in a perfect position, but he's picked up a shadow. He's got Matthew Goss on his left shoulder. Gossi squeezing through an impossible gap. He will not let the wheel go there of Andre Greipel. And there's a little break because of the pure speed, and there's the final lead out, and look at the set jaw of Greipel as they swing down towards the line. Goss has got his back wheel, and that's what he wanted here, and right on the back wheel is Boy Van Poppel as well. But Greipel goes, and Goss chases him, and is Goss going to get it on the line? And the answer is no. Andre Greipel has started again in the Santos Tour down under. The third time he has won this opening race, and the team really had all control for him. Yeah, it was a great win for Andre Greipel. Of course, it doesn't count for the uh, UCI World points, but uh, a good win he did it last year, Andre Greipel. And you can see the guy on his shoulder, Matty Goss. I think we're going to see those two names pretty often throughout the course of this week. That's what we'd expect. Also, watch out for Boy Van Poppel. He's spinning very well, and his father's the manager of the team. Chris Sutton, always a good spinner here. Eddie Boysenhagen, he won the points in this race last year and would like to do well again. So we'll see. But I think that uh, Andre Greipel has thrown the gauntlet down again. It is great to be live we're live all week right throughout until sunday and uh, you can just check those local guides on gem and the nine network and uh, that is happening right now even as we speak in one of the most beautiful parts of this country we're deep in the adelaide hills now we're running over the top of checker hill we've completed the descent here with jordan kirby he's the boy that got away let's have a look how he did it we'll go back to the start earlier today this will be the course that they face. It's 135 kilometres. Yes, we're in South Australia now. The riders stay in Adelaide. They've moved up the road a little ways to prospect uh, to make their start today. That's where we started from a year ago. We're bound for Clare. Then now we're heading our first time finish in at Lobethal. They've been over Checker Hill. And we've seen there that we've got a first leader in the King of the Mountains competition. Three sprints, four, and we get to Charleston. And then we'll see the finish twice at Lobethal before we finally race for the line. Yeah, those sprints are going to be very important tactically today because uh, every rider that goes, the first three riders to go over those sprint points will earn themselves three, two and one second time bonus. There's ten seconds time bonus for the first rider to get to the finish. So it could be a mathematical nightmare to decide who's going to lead this race at the end <laughs> yeah, of the day. Yeah, so those three sprints, first time we've seen three sprints yeah. in uh, a stage and that'll happen today, of course. All right, <laughs> they all have the tactics. It's that sort of sport. Um, let's have a listen to a few of the riders and uh, their thoughts prior to the first stage of the Santos Tour Down Under. A tremendous ride in the Classic on Sunday. Um, was that your plan from the get-go to, to go out the front? Uh, yes, it was. I mean, I'm not a sprinter, and so I you know, couldn't win a sprint against Greipel and Kittel. So I thought as well I might show my colours a little bit, you know, and give the boys a run for their money. Yeah, look, it is going to be a bit of a sprint today. I think uh, the, the finishing circuit isn't easy. From 10 kilometres to go until 5 kilometres to go is a little bit undulating. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a little bit tougher than the, the Sunday night race, that's for sure. But uh, I think we'll see a, a group coming to the finish and having a sprint today. And hopefully we can climb one step higher on the podium. It's another chance for the sprinters. Uh, of course, it's a bit uh, of a challenge. It's not that easy to Lobotal. And uh, the last laps we have to do there. But, uh, yeah. I think it's still possible for us and uh, I think we recovered good and uh, yeah, we're going to try again. Okay, uh, very technical, the last part of today's course. Uh, from a team perspective, um, what, what is your approach to that final couple of loops? Yeah, like you said, it's a, a really, uh, there are a lot of corners and it will be really fast. So uh, yeah, the best is to stay in front and uh, it will be not easy, but uh, yeah. There are also a couple of climbs before, so first we have to stay with a bunch to to hit the front, and uh, yeah, we will see how we do it. 
<laughs> They'd be good poker players. They, they don't give much away, <laughs> do they? <laughs> well, he did win the first days last year from Prospect, but it went to Clare. Now, of course, we're heading to Lobotol. Much more difficult finish than it was at Clare. Um, but he's got the team behind him, hasn't he? Well, I think, you know, if you cast the cast my mind back 12 months last year, he started extremely well off here at the Santos Tour Down Under. That team stayed together throughout the whole season and took him to some very, very impressive Tour de France victories as well. OK, well, there's the indication of how long they have been out on the course. Uh, of course, Prospect to Lobethal, as you mentioned, 135 kilometres. Uh, let's get a bit of a, uh, an update now on uh, what has happened this morning. Well, it's been a very quick start. Two, We've seen this one, was the situation at the start in Prospect as all of the riders rolled away, the 19 top teams in the world, heading out on the beautiful blue skies. It was a perfect start today. The, the temperatures are ideal for the rollout. Uh, it's neutralised, so they clear the town and get to know each other as they head out towards the start around Mawson Lakes. Just at the start there, celebrating, you might have noticed, the 100th edition of the Tour de France this year, the 15th edition of the Santos Tour Down Under. So Santos Tour Down Under giving uh, a big uh, well done to the Tour de France, which, of course, comes up in the month of July. Now, Mike Turto is the man pulling the flag in there, 1984 Olympic gold medalist in the team pursuit. He's now the race director and has been ever since inception of this tour in his 15th year, as Paul has said. A little bit of action here immediately. Riders trying to break the elastic straight away and they pull that big field out into a long straight line, uh, tucking into speeds just over 50 kilometers an hour. Then a lone attack and no reaction from the field. And that is Jordan Kirby. One look over his shoulder. Anybody going to join me, he said. Doesn't look like it, and that's the situation right now. He's still in the lead. Not a surprise to see uh, Uni SA, and by the time he got to Checker Hill, he had about a seven-minute advantage over the main field. And by going over the top in first place, that will guarantee him at the end of today to be the leader in the Skoda King of the Mountains competition. Yeah, it's some wonderful pitches and some great characters. The crowds have already been outstanding today and they'll continue right throughout the course of the week. We had beautiful crowds on the weekend in Adelaide and uh, what a day for Jordan Kirby so far. Something that can't be taken away from him. He's going to be a tired boy tonight. He won't need any rocking to go to bed. They are live pitches right at the moment. Yeah, he's still got a gap over the field. He's been out to over seven minutes was the last time check we heard, but I think it's on the reversal now. There's the uh, contours of the route today. We've been over the M there, we continue on. The route, as you can see, stays undulating. Now, the contours look the same. It's because we do two full circuits of Lobethal. Uh, once we get there, well, so we pass under the banner three times, third time the race will finish. Uh, it's going to be tough for him to stay out there. This wind is getting stronger even since we came on air. It's got up uh, in its uh, speed, so he's going to find a headwind finish today. He's not going to like that on the way into the finish. But, hey, he's already the leader in one competition for tomorrow, so he had a good day. Well, he went out and made for that lone breakaway, but you can be absolutely certain the teams of the sprinters, when we come down to the couple of circuits around here, they're going to get themselves a very organised. It'll be, for my book, it'll be Argos Shimano and Lotto Bellisol who will do all of the pacemaking. So you, when, when you've got to two big, strong teams like that against one lone leader, it doesn't work out very often. We mm. mentioned the breeze, we mentioned the beautiful blue skies. They'll be here all week. Obviously, the UV reading is pretty high, so we do have our L'Oreal men expert uh, moisturise on. All of us do, <laughs> as does Robbie McEwen, the 12-time stage winner here at the Santos Tour Down Under. And at the start line, before it got all underway, we got his thoughts on how it was all going to pan out. Today is widely expected to be a sprint, but this stage will throw a bit of everything at the riders. Early in the stage, we've got uh, a few hills on the way out through Golden Grove, over Checker Hill. If the break hasn't moved away by Checker Hill, you'd expect some real fireworks. Further on into the stage, we've got a, a technical run into the finish with a few left and right curves. And the riders I expect to be in contention today, obviously Andre Greipel, he's always in contention, Matt Goss, CJ Sutton, his teammate Edwald Bossenhagen. Got a bit of a dark horse today, the Garmin Sharp rider, Australian Steel Von Hoff. It's an uphill finish, rises all the way to the line. Look out for the real strong men. Good on you, Robbie. We can see Andre breathing down Robbie's neck because Andre Grob.
I am going to say Henri's going to win, but I'd watch out. Robbie mentioned there a rider, Steele von Hoff. He's in his second year now as a top pro in an American Garmin team, and he was bronze medalist in the Elite Men's Road Race Championship in Bunningyong just on a week ago, and he can sprint fast. Well, all I can say really is it's Andre Greipel's race to lose here this afternoon. I think he's got the best drill squad, but, you know, they will all be queuing up on his back wheel, hoping that he makes a mistake. <laughs> all looking forward to your mellifluous tones in commentary, <laughs> gentlemen. We can't wait for that. This is Chad. Channel 9's Wide World of Sports, they are live pitches. Great to have your company. We'll be on our bikes after this. Well, we're looking here at Jordan Kirby now, the rider who's surprised. He's under 23 years of age. He's a Queenslander. And so he's racing in the warmth of the South Australian sun. He's been out front since the flag was pulled in after only eight kilometres today, Paul, about five miles. He was two and three quarter minutes ahead. He's built to over seven. And now the riders are taking quite an interest in his escape. Yeah, it's mainly two teams that are organising themselves at the front end of the main field. He, as you can see there, he's riding in the middle of his cluster. He uh, went pretty much out from the gun, and that gap has come down, Phil, from seven minutes to three minutes and 15 seconds now. And that's because of the work of the teams of the sprinters who've all come to the front. They saw that gap getting very, very large at the seven-minute margin. They said, no, nope, that's too much. We'll get ourselves organised, which is what we're seeing right now. Well, not surprisingly, because... Uh he is a rider beginning his uh, pro career this year. A little later on, once this race is over, he'll start to move across to Europe, where he joins the uh, pro team Christina Watches. This is Luke Durbridge, I think, out on the front at the moment, the new Australian champion. He is the elite professional champion. That uh, was an event held in Bunningyon just uh, a week ago, yesterday, and he won the title to add to the earlier time trial championship he won. This is Olivier Kaisen, who seems to be the pacemaker here in the early stages for the Lotto Bellasol team. He did exactly the same thing uh, on Sunday in the circuit race, and now he's doing it again here. He's mixing it nicely with the Argos Shimano riders. They have a very good sprinter in Marcel Kittel. He's 161, if you catch his number. Just seeing Will Clark here, the Australian member of the Argos Shimano squad. Yeah, the riders have a very good chance today of uh, having a dress rehearsal of the finishing line as well, because uh, just looking here, this is uh, looks like Greg Henderson coming up to have a chat with the rest of the team from Lotto Bellisol. They go through the finishing uh, line on uh, three separate occasions, and that will give them a chance to see what the approach up to the line looks like. So they've got no excuses for getting their sprint uh, effort timed wrongly. Turbo Derbo, they call him. Little thick of the elbow. Uh, that means you want somebody else to come through. They're doing just enough to hold the control of the breakaway here. They're waiting, I think, until they head down through Charleston, the first sprint of the day in the Jayco Sprint Competition, and then uh, where there's also a three-second time bonus awaiting the first rider. Three, two, and one at the three times we pass through uh, Charleston in the race stage today. And then you get a 10, 6, 4 uh, time bonus for the first three who win the day. So it is possible... Uh, to win the stage but lose the race lead here today. It depends how Kirby finishes overall because I think he's going to be out front for the first small bonus. Well, just looking at the riders here and the organisation, uh, you can see the, the speed that they're riding along at. They're approaching 45, 46 kilometres an hour at a time like this. Same two teams, so that to me, although we have at least 16 world-class sprinters in this race, it's just been these two teams that have done all of the chasing. Now, the interruption, this rider here, Luke Derbridge, he's been sent up by the Orica Green Edge squad because they have a good sprinter in Matthew Goss. He's already told us he hopes to go one step higher on the podium because he was second on Sunday in the People's Choice uh, race there. Is watching this, Adam Hansen, a Queensland and Australia, number 22, but indeed very much part of Andre Greipel's lead out train, Hansen. Yep, and there he is, number 21, Andre Greipel. And uh, just notice today, Phil, he's actually wearing a skin suit. Very often uh, on a road stage like this, the riders will wear shorts and a jersey. But because I think of the short stage we're looking at here, just 135 kilometres, which is only really a ride in the park for some of these top professional bike riders, he's decided to go for the one-piece combinaison. Looking 
pretty relaxed at the moment. Greipel not under any pressure. He knows the area probably as well as any Australian. He's been coming over here for a couple of years. He's on two occasions won this race outright. And uh, 11 stage victories. If he gets today, he'll equal Robin McEwen's 12 record stage victories. Just also noticed that uh, riding alongside him there was the Kiwi Greg Henderson. He's also wearing a skin suit, sort of uh, aerodynamic suit that you would see riders uh, normally riding only in the individual time trial or when they're racing on the track. So they're obviously taking every little advantage they can to make sure that they come into town here as quickly as possible to try and set up that first stage victory for their man, Andre Greipel. But there will be a lot of other sprinters, Phil, queuing up behind him, including, of course, the man you mentioned earlier, Matty Goss. Now, the whiteboard being shown there to Jordan Kirby will be telling him the latest time check. And I think he's going to see it more or less halved. It'll be just over three minutes is what he's getting. He had exactly seven minutes after only 16 kilometres, 10 miles into the stage today. But these boys immediately took an interest when he got to that sort of proportion. Three teams contributing, three teams expecting to mix it for the sprint finish. I must say the Argus boys are looking pretty impressive. Kuhn de Court sitting there and his teammate just going through behind him is Albert Timmer. They're all here. And the last one should be number 161, and that will be Marcel Kittel, the German sprinter. These are the jerseys of the, the Vacon Soleil team there. You can see grouped together. They've got a very good sprinter, uh, Boy Van Poppel. His dad is the team manager, Jean-Paul Van Poppel, himself a very, very big sprinter in the 1980s and 1990s. One big sprinter who's not in this race but was the arch rival for a couple of years and still is indeed of Andre Greipel is the British rider Mark Cavendish. He's off to a great start for his new team, the Amiga Farmer Quick Step team, who we'll also have riders in this race because he's just won the opening stage in South America of the Tour of San Luis. So he's the first leader of that race. First race for his new team and a win. You can't do much better than that. Well, it's good, uh, good for the morale to get that first victory under the belt, and that's probably why uh, Andre Greipel's going to just be that little bit more in a position to try and win today. He'll be a bit more relaxed having got the first win under his belt, but once we come into town, once we start to see the organisation of the teams of the sprinters, you can be certain, Phil, there will be a massive battle for the wheel of Andre Greipel to try and use his slipstream to try and get the win for one of the other sprinters. A young... Uh head on wise shoulders here keep taking in the fluid the wet temperature is steadily climbing up in the hills so is the pace it's 135 kilometers good opening length 84 miles if you calculate the distance in miles checker hill is behind them and jordan kirby the new under 23 aussie road race champion is the man who is leading the race and he's got the first points in the skoda king of the mountains competition so he gets to where the leaders green spotted jersey tomorrow tough day tomorrow paul because we go up corkscrew hill hello corkscrew hill's been around a long time for the last 15 years this race has avoided it tomorrow they're going to tackle it if you talk to any of the local cyclists about that climb uh, they say it really is quite horrendous it doesn't uh, let up until you get right over the top and the exciting thing for the race i have to say phil is that the finishing line is only seven kilometers away from the top of that hill and we could see the first major decision made for the overall classification battle the sun coming just on the backs of the riders at the moment they've got the whole road of course the road shut down for the event we will enter the circuit before we arrive at charleston uh, we'll pass through charleston three times then we'll go through the finishing line uh, for two full laps of the circuit what do you think about Marcel Kittel, the, the sprinter on the Argos Shimano team? That's the team on the far side with the white jerseys and the, the blue lettering across the middle. He started his life off as an individual time trialist uh, and the junior level of the sport. He was twice world time trial champion. Since then, he's turned out to be a very fast sprinter. Had 13 wins last season and he's going to be a major rival on all of the sprint stages throughout this Santos Tour Down Under to Andre Greipel, who so far has drawn first blood in Australia with his win in the People's Choice. A little bit of a relaxing moment going on here because the Lotto Bellasol team distribution of drinking bottles. As the, the rider's been to the back, the team car's taken the bottles, come back to the front and giving them to his teammates. So... They know the work has got to be done, but I am sure they are not going to reel in uh, Jordan Kirby until we get onto that finishing circuit. 
and you know he knows he's not going to stay away it's unfortunate in some ways because the circuit inspires the chasing and they'll get two looks at the finishing line today before they actually race for it but he could be lining himself up to earn some uh, time bonus points out on the course because when he once he gets into Charleston and the race will go through Charleston on three occasions there's a three second time bonus for the first rider to cross the line and that's probably what he's thinking about because if he can get himself some of those time bonuses he will sit up high in the overall standings just continuing on here Looks he's in and out of the saddle a lot of times now, uh, Jordan Kirby, and it's almost as if his back is beginning to eight here. There's the distance left to ride, 68 kilometres, doesn't sound very far, but it is a long way because it's on two 25-kilometre laps. So we're approximately 17 kilometres from seeing the finishing line first time. And as the teams of the sprinters start to wind it up, I would think that 67.8 kilometres will probably get covered in around about an hour and a half of racing. The last uh, lap, the last 25 kilometre lap around here, around the finishing town, I think, Phil, will be run off at close to 50 kilometres an hour. Jordan Kirby, the attacker, riding for UniSA. We should have predicted it. Three kilometres from the first sprint point, which will take us into Charleston for the first time. Small time bonuses there, three, two and one for the first three riders over the line. And I think uh, Kirby is going to start getting those time bonuses this time. Whether he'll be away the next time they reach there, which is 25 kilometres loop, that's a very big question. Well, you can see how much confidence uh, that Targo Shimano have got. They've got nearly all of their team up at the front end of the main field. Interesting to see the uh, Australian national champion there, Durbridge, he's doing the pacemaking for his man, Matty Goss, but they will hold themselves back a fraction and then get themselves organised towards the front end of the main field once we get into the last uh, 14 or 15 kilometres. Kirby the, cuts a lonely figure down there on a road as wide as this as he takes the inside corner. Here in Australia, they ride on the left of the road, but the roads are closed and the man who is the under-23 Australian champion out in front. So as we look down here, sorry about the little bit of picture breakup. We're looking at Jordan Kirby here as we welcome all our international viewers from around the world to the Santos Tour Down Under. Approximately uh, half distance for the stage today. It's 135 kilometres or 84 miles. Uh, Jordan Kirby has topped over the only climb of the day, which he's won, so he'll be the first leader in the Skoda King of the Mountains tomorrow. And now he's heading up towards the first sprint of the day at Charleston, which carries a small time bonus. He is the Australian under-23 road racing champion, Jordan Kirby. As we can just uh, have a look at the tracing of the route for you. Riders got underway today uh, when they left uh, Prospect, which is to the north of Adelaide, which is where the riders are camping out for the next week, and then heading up to Lobatal. A first-time finish for the riders here as they raced up to the race start proper, just out towards Mawson Lakes, heading into over the uh, climb, which we've seen at 42 kilometres in. Now we're heading for Charleston, the first one at 67.4 kilometres. Then we join a 50, uh, a 25 kilometre circuit. We cover it twice. And this is the L'Oreal Men Expert event. This is what the profile looks like. This is where they've uh, gone through so far. And they've actually just got, in fact, the leader has just got to the first uh, sprint point and he will pick himself up some points and he will also pick himself up a three second time bonus you can see the uh, the way it says looks a little bit repetitive the profile down towards the end i think it's a very tough technical circuit but it will be controlled uh, quite admirably i expect by the teams of the sprinters who feel in this year's santos tour down under they don't have that many occasions to show why they're the fastest warriors of the road Kirby here, as we now see the counter-attacks where we should have predicted this one as well, I think, Paul, because this is Jens Voigt, who's decided to hunt down Jordan Kirby, the irrepressible German who was in the lead for 21 of the 30 laps of the circuit race last Sunday in Adelaide, where 180,000, 108,000 people watched that.
Well, don't forget, Jens Voigt knows that this race in the past has very often been decided just by a few seconds. So Jens Voigt here will be looking at trying to get himself second place when he goes through the sprint point at Charles, and that will give him a two-second time bonus. Almost see the difference in the speed with Jens Voigt jumping out of the main field and the lone leader here, Jordan Kirby. He's getting himself into a rhythm, but he's actually getting himself also, Phil, onto this finishing circuit now. And it is uh, a slightly undulating circuit, I'd have to say, what the riders uh, in the professional ranks would call a heavy finishing circuit. Opening sprint for the Jayco Points competition, the competition won last year by Edvald Boysenhagen of Team Sky. He's back, and he's back as the champion of Norway this year. Uh, we haven't seen too much of him yet. There hasn't been much chance, really, uh, as we this man attacked in at just after one kilometre into the race. And he's going to pick himself up three seconds time bonus here. Two times, by the way, he's been a world junior champion, uh, Jordan Kirby. He won the points and the team pursuit. And he's now in the under-23 category and starting out live as a professional this season as the under-23 road race champion. He won't, in fact, be 21 years of age until August this year. There's the line. First blood for the Jayco Sprint competition going to Jordan Kirby. And more importantly at the moment, Paul, is a three-second time bonus. Yep, that is exactly what he will be looking for because if he can uh, stay away for another 25 kilometres, he will get himself another three-second time bonus. And that would put him at the end of the day, as long as he finishes in the main field, and put him up in the top ten in the overall rankings. And that's what he and the UniSA team will be looking at here this afternoon. They always ride well, the UniSA team, where when they come down here. And Jens Voigt uh, didn't manage to stay clear because look how fast the sprinters are now starting to wind it up. Yeah, this is interesting. All heads are turning here to see if the sprinters are going to snatch this because it's very important for the sprinters to get small-time bonuses on this opening day when they can. It's almost a dress rehearsal perhaps for the later spin finish because this is a much hillier race than it normally is over the next five days after this. It may be uh, swinging towards the climbers and the opportunities, but it looks as though Matty Goss has got an interest here. Well, that's what he's thinking about. He's thinking about the overall lead at the end of the day. He's going to get challenged there by Sutton on the left-hand side, too. Chris Sutton of Team Sky trying to come through and snatch all this for a two-second time bonus. Good job that lady jumped back in as they came up towards the line. It looks to me as though Agossi has taken that out. Simon Gerrans, I think. It could be Simon. I can't actually... Our camera's wobbling a bit here. Well, if that is Simon Gerrans, that was one terrific sprint by him. And it was, in fact, Stuart O'Grady, wasn't it? No, number one, the winner of the race... And that is a very interesting result for Simon Gerrans uh, to get a two-second time bonus, last year's defending champion. Last year's defending champion, equal on time, if you remember, with Alejandro Valverde. So he realises, again, seconds out on the road like this can be very, very important at the end of six days of racing. Well, let's just have a little look how it all happened as the rider is now settling down again. And uh, they're heading now uh, on the course. They're heading down towards Woodside today. Gerrand will be very, very pleased with a sprint like that. The National Motor Museum at Birdwood has had millions of visitors here since opening in 1965. It's the history of Australian road transport. The Motor Museum is the home to an internationally acclaimed collection of vintage veteran and indeed classic vehicles. And the riders moments ago have just passed that point. Now there they are, the main field, all together. The Adelaide Hills is renowned for its great food and its great wine. There are over 40 cellar doors for you to visit and enjoy. Well, this is actually the Air Peninsula here, as you can swim amongst the uh, sea lions here and the dolphins as they enjoy these cool blue waters. The wine, of course, is the big attraction, and so too is the, f is the famous uh, seafood. This is the whole area here is, uh, is spectacular in blue skies. Well, as you can see, these guys have uh, decided to turn off the gas just a fraction. A few moments ago, they were bowling along at close to 50, 55 kilometres an hour. They've gone through the first sprint point at Charleston, where Simon Gerrans uh, grabbed himself, as you said, Phil, a cheeky little two-second time bonus. 
However, I wonder when the helicopter moves back like this, if it's going to give us an indication that that gap is well inside of the three minute margin. There it uh -oh. is. I would put that gap at approximately a minute and 20 seconds. They've got him completely in their sights. I think the, the lights are going out for the lone leader. Well, it's not a bad thing, Paul, because he's only a youngster. He's 20 years of age. He doesn't want to stay out there all day. He's not expecting to win the stage. He's got himself a leader's jersey tomorrow. He's taken the first sprint at the Jayco sprint point, so that's giving him three seconds time bonus. He needs to save his energy now, let these boys come up. There's a chance to see the world champion, Philippe Gilbert of Belgium. This is his fourth visit to this race, but it's certainly the first as a world champion, a title he's never won before. One of his three victories in uh, last year's season. The other two both came in the Vuelta de España, which is the Tour of Spain. And Gilbert says he'll be happy with the stage win over the next six days of racing. And uh, don't be surprised if he does just that. Do you think the old Wollonga Hill will suit him on Saturday, Paul? I think there's a couple of stages that would suit him, Phil. Uh, the stage around uh, Stirling. Corkscrew Hill would be the sort of stage that he would enjoy. Trying to listen into what these two riders are talking about there. They're the big rider with the uh, light blue shoulders there. That's Herd Stegerman's won a stage into Ghent a couple of years ago. I have a feeling, though, that Philippe Gilbert, the world champion, Phil, could be even looking at a podium position overall when we get down towards the end of this race. There he is, just over to the right-hand side, wearing number 11. And riding alongside number four there, Matthew Goss, which is the man we thought had won that sprint. Let's have a quick uh, journey around the stage so far. The start was in Prospect, just outside of the centre of the city of Adelaide. Riders neutralised procession as they left town beneath clear blue skies. Once out on the highway, flag came in, race was on as flurry of attacks straight away this one three riders going clear was quickly jumped on by a peloton that didn't drop below 50 kilometers an hour just take a look at that as they all scurried up heading out to past Mawson lakes and out up towards the uh, entry point into the adelaide hills then the lone figure breaking away of Jordan Kirby. This is the climb of Checker Hill at 42 kilometres in. It is a very steep climb, as you can see here. Traditionally, a big crowd on the summit. First points in the Skoda King of the Mountains for Jordan Kirby as he went up over the top of the climb. Just uh, chasing him over there, I think it was Chris Anker Sorensen. As the field then were just on seven minutes behind, but they closed in slowly but surely. Jens Voigt tried an attack as they were approaching the first uh, Jayco sprint at Charleston. A uh, minute and a half ahead, though, was still Jordan Kirby. Then a real tussle for second place. And the surprise was, with an incredibly good sprint, uh, last year's final winner of this race, and he's won this race twice, Simon Gerrans, he took the valuable two seconds time bonus. I think that was an interesting move by Simon Gerrans. He's obviously got uh, thoughts of trying to win this bike race again. The peloton have slowed down a fraction for the moment because they realise they're still looking at a good 60-odd kilometres to get themselves down towards the finish, and they don't want to expend too much energy. They know any time they accelerate now, they can pull the lone leader, Jordan Kirby, back into the fold. So the riders are heading now towards their first sighting of the finishing line in Lobethal. down here from the helicopter you can see from the uh, brown grasses of the fields here it has been very very dry this is the height of the Australian summer temperatures can be well in excess of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius and uh, a little bit of rain would be a likened here but it's unlikely to happen the temperatures though are perfect today at 23 degrees at the moment and the race under control we still have the one rider out in front uh, but they have him under control now and they're letting him cook. Well, when they get to the long straightaways, Phil, they can actually see him there, judging their position uh, behind him by looking at the race helicopter above the race. And they can judge uh, what sort of distance between themselves and the lone leader. As you can see by the tempo and the style of these riders, they're not chasing in earnest at all now. They know when they want to make the move. I don't think we'll see any counter moves coming here because this is one of the rare opportunities in this year's Santos Tour Down Under for the sprinters to have their day. And in the red on the left, Martin Kohler, he held the race lead in this event a year ago on two separate occasions. And that all well for the future because in the month of June, back home in his native Switzerland, he won 
the National Road Racing Championship for the first time. He'd had a bronze medal in that competition back in 2011, but he got the big one. The gold medal and the right to wear the white cross and the red jersey this year in the season 2013. So I think we might see a little bit of Martin Kohler. He rides for Team BMC, which, by the way, is the same team as Cadell Evans. Cadell Evans doesn't like riding the Tour Down Under because it comes at the wrong time of his preparation for the Tour de France. Well, that's the problem, Phil, though, with, uh, with the, the calendar these riders face nowadays. The calendar is such a long calendar, starting racing in the month of January right the way through to the month of October. If you've got certain preaks and troughs that you want to respect, like Cadell Evans, sometimes you have to miss participating in a race like this. But we did have the honour of Cadell Evans riding the Santos Tour Down Under when he was the world champion. And it was great to see the world champion's jersey at the front on the stage around Wollonga Hill. And I wonder if we'll see that world champion's jersey again at Wollonga Hill with Philippe Gilbert, the Belgian, this year. Wouldn't it be nice? Cadell Evans felt he had to show off uh, the first ever Australian professional road championship, uh, winning that world title, and he, and he did uh, come to the Santos Tour Down Under on that occasion. A little bit of a reshuffle there, but still it's mainly the Lotto Bellasol boys who believe they've got the day's winner in Andre Greipel. Uh, being helped out, uh, Luke Derbridge on the far right and Orica Greenhead, they've got Matthew Goss. And I've noticed Chris Anker Sorensen bringing the Tinkoff for the Saxo Tinkoff riders up towards the front as well. Tim G Duggan on the far right in the blue, he's the champion of the USA. He's a rider who in the past has made a big reputation for himself as a worker for the team, but when he went to the American Championships uh, towards the end of last year in... Uh, North Carolina, he got himself the chance to ride for himself and he got that uh, work, that American title and he was very, very proud of it. But I think in a race like this one here, Phil, he will sacrifice himself for the team because he really is a good hard worker. It'll spin round the vineyards here because up in these hills, in the Adelaide Hills, they do very much grow wine and terrific wine it is too. South Australian wine is famous throughout the world. We're seeing it a little bit better than the boys here as they grind their way up steadily uphill. The undulations are bound here now, but the road surfaces are good. And a little bit of protection from the wind, but the wind is blowing, and it will be on the nose as they approach the finishing line for the first time. They're almost slowing down here. They're just not interested at all now in Jordan Kirby. So as we look at the peloton here on the way, let's... Uh, see how this tour has evolved and let's hear it from the race director Mike Turter. What I've noticed in the race over the last five years in particular since being pro tour is that the quality's gone through the roof. I mean in the old days we used to have breakaways at 20, 25 minutes ahead of the peloton. I mean we, we won't see those uh, type of breaks anymore. Um, it's a more compact race, a lot higher level and uh, the teams throughout from top to bottom the quality is um, at an all-time high. To have Gilbert here is fantastic. Andy Schleck, uh, a big uh, Grand uh, Tour winner and also a big Grand Tour rider, is also terrific for us also. Then if you look through the rest of the field, it's just quality from top to bottom. I think Guerin's going back to back is a big thing. It's never been done before in the race. I know he's keen to do it, so I'll be looking with interest with Orica Greenedge, of course. Yes, well, we recorded that, of course, before we saw Simon Gerrans go for the time bonus sprint in Charleston and got himself two seconds. Uh, so he is looking to go back to back. Well, his, uh, his, his morale is there, the team is there, the team, the team has a two-pronged attack here at the Santos Tour Down Under. Obviously, they want to get themselves a, a stage victory with Matthew Goss. He, he was second in the People's Choice Classic uh, just on Sunday night a couple of days ago. If he could get himself a, an opening stage victory here, that would take a bit of pressure off the team and they could concentrate on winning the race overall. Gentle meander through the South Australian winelands here in the Adelaide Hills. We're bound today to Lobethal, and we left Prospect earlier today. We've come a little bit along the route now. We've been through the Mountain Prize, won by Jordan Kirby. We've been through the sprint at Charleston once, the two more visits through there, won by Jordan Kirby. Kirby still out in front. The peloton got very close to him, in fact. They got within one and a half minutes, and he had seven and now they've allowed him to run a little bit more, so they haven't brought him back yet. Now, this is the waiting game now, Phil. Uh, let's not forget, it's all about uh, getting across the line in first place. It doesn't matter how fast you get there, 
but you just want to make sure that uh, you save all of your energy and conserve energy for the most strategic points of this race over six days. And there's a lot more to come. Well, that gap has stretched back out to a two and a half minute margin. Uh, he's added a minute, and as you could see there, we're coursing through now some of the finest uh, wine areas of uh, South Australia in the Adelaide Hills. The Adelaide Hills, renowned, of course, for its great food and indeed its great wine. There are over 40 cellar doors for you to visit and enjoy. You can taste the food and uh, you can drink the wine right from the source. You can even pick your fruit like delicious Hills strawberries. And they really do look rather delicious, don't they? But the boys won't have time to stop and go strawberry picking today. We're in the summer, don't forget, here in uh, Australia, as the riders now have lost a minute here by just easing off the pressure. They've allowed the fish to come right in, and they've let him go again. And uh, next time we, we see any uh, banners, it's going to be passing through the finish in Lobethal. But unfortunately for Jordan Kirby, the under-23 Australian road race champion, there'll still be 50 kilometres to go. And it's going to be a hard 50 kilometres for him, and uh, we will see the organisation coming. Uh, so far, it's uh, Argos Shimano from uh, from Holland, who's been very keen to do pacemaking. They've always had help from the team Lotto Belisol. We've got Lotto Belisol at the front. This is Kaizen wearing number 23 here. Just sits there and uh, sets a false tempo to make sure that to gap, which is grown up again a little bit to two and a half minutes doesn't start to read astronomical proportions quite a long peloton licking his lips dead center there just popped in behind his teammate is simon gerrans he's the defending champion he had a wonderful season last year orica green edge is the first all australian sponsored team and they made the tour de france last year and that probably was the only event they rode where they didn't actually win a stage and that's left them some room to maneuver when we cover the 100th Tour de France in July. But they had a wonderful season, particularly with Gerrans. It is amazing the way the sport has changed over the last 10 or 15 years. The sport was uh, very much dominated just by European teams. Nowadays, we're looking at uh, a completely different uh, international sport of professional cycling. We get a, a good look there at Simon Gerrans because we've got three American teams on the international circuit, uh, an Australian team which was born last year and Team Sky of Great Britain. And who would have ever thought that was going to happen? Two top teams from most unexpected place. He's right behind Simon Clark, himself uh, had a wonderful year. He won the King of the Mountains in the Tour of Spain. And a good stage in there. Stuart O'Grady, we had a long chat with Stuart last night uh, with the Premier of South Australia, Jay Wetherill, and it was a wonderful occasion. And Stuart really, he just came over as a man who just simply loves to ride a bike. Well, he's the captain, I would say, on the road for Orica Green Edge. He's got so much experience. Uh, amazing to think the first time I met him was 1994 when he was chatting with a Frenchman by the name of Roger Leger, who'd seen that this man, uh, pretty much regarded as the best track cyclist in the world, mm -hmm. had a great career ahead of him on the road. And uh, he said uh, last night when we were chatting to him, one of his greatest moments was when he was given the nod by Fabian Cancellara to go out and try and win Paris-Roubaix, which he did. And he's worn the yellow jersey in the Tour de France and he became the first ever Australian to wear the green jersey in the Tour de France, but he never did win it. Well, he hasn't yet. Anyway, he's ridden the Tour de France 16 times. We now go forward to a man who's never been to France, I don't think, yet, Jordan Kirby. And uh, he will this year because he's embarking on his professional career and he's shown everybody why he's got a contract for the summer. Yes, he was uh, signed up just towards the end of last season by the Danish registered team, Christina Watches. So once this race is uh, done and dusted, uh, he'll be like many of the other professional bike riders in the event here this afternoon, boarding uh, a long haul plane to get himself up to Europe to start racing on the international circuit really is quite remarkable uh, when you think uh, when in in the 1980s there was uh, one Australian professional cyclist in uh, in the world his name was Phil Anderson now there are about 60 or 70 scattered around around the globe well talking about the UNISA team of which uh, Jordan Kirby is a part of it really did catch the eye at last year's Santos tour down under and we caught up with two of this year's UNISA members with similar ambition UNISA are definitely renowned for uh, being in the early break and um yeah, definitely giving it to the pros and trying to mix it with the best. And um, I think this year is going to be no different for our entire team. And for me in particular, um, definitely want to be aggressive and uh, get my name out there amongst all the professional teams and uh, chase that professional contract towards the end of the year. 
I mean, the team last year proved you can also do really well in the results here with um, Will Clark getting the stage and Rowan doing really well overall. So, you know, you never know that could happen with us as well. So we'll always be looking for that. But, yeah, make an aggressive and hard race, definitely. Yes, Damien Housen, the first man there, and Adam Phelan. And Damien Housen, by the way, he comes off a gold in the time trial and a silver in the road race to the man who's leading this race at the moment. And now they're, they're teammates on this occasion. So Jordan Kirby out in front by two and a half minutes. But raising good points there because it is actually at races like this when the youngsters are 19, 20, 21 year old Australians get a chance to uh, ride aggressively and show how much talent they've got to all of the international team managers who are following this race. Uh, in the race, race cars behind for them gives them a chance to see uh, where the next bit of talent is going to come from. Well, UNESA actually won this race with uh, Patrick Yonker, who is a South Australian, lives in Adelaide. He wasn't a young man on that occasion. He was getting towards the end of his career. But what a great moment it was uh, for UNESA back in 2004. Now, here we go. A first chance to see the finishing line now. The crowd is ready as we enter Lobethal. And a lovely welcome for this young man, 20 years of age, as he heads up towards what will be the finishing line in 50 kilometres time. Big moment for this man, the national under-23 champion of Australia, now showing them all his worth. Well, at least he's going to get himself uh, through the finishing line here in first place to the accolades of the crowd. This is the finishing line that the riders will go through th on three occasions. Two full laps around here, two very difficult laps, I'd have to say. On the opposite side of the course, uh, they'll go through the town of Charleston for the second time. And again, time bonuses are available for the first three riders to cross the line. Now he's looking at 50 kilometres to go. That should take around about an hour and five minutes. Well taken as he snatches his bag there at the Powerade Hydration Station. Two minutes 20, it said on the clock, and he's led this race ball for two minutes and 15. Two up, uh, two minutes, two, uh, two hours and 15. Yep, he uh, pretty much came out from the starting box. One of his teammates made the first attack of the day. That was a small little flurry of activity. That came back together very quickly. And, and within a kilometre of the start of the race, that's when he leapt out of the pack and built up at one stage that seven-minute advantage over the main field. Important in a race like this field to keep yourself topped up with fluids. And Lobethal welcoming the race, what for the first time is a finish. Absolutely right. It's taken 15 years to come here to finish the stage of the race. We're not that far away from downtown Adelaide by car about 45 minutes. It's a beautiful drive too through the gorges and down into the, uh, the metropolis of the city of Adelaide. Nothing's far away from Adelaide, I have to say. There's the peloton. They're bound now. They're around about two and a half. We should get an accurate time check as they go under that banner. There's the town of Lobethal. We're going right up that main street and then out onto a... It's quite a difficult circuit, this. Um, it's got good undulations on it. Not officially, none of them count for the Skoda King of the Mountains, but they're going to hurt the riders when they start hitting them at speed. Well, we've got a chance there to see the main field there already in town, and still it's uh, Lotto Bellisol at the front doing this false tempo. This is not a chase going on at the moment. It's a false tempo to make sure that advantage doesn't get a little bit too crazy. But I have to say, Phil, that uh, Argos Shimano are a solid block of a team, always in the second row, always waiting to take over in case there's any faltering by the, the Belgian squad Lotto. Santos Tour down under, coming into Lobethal, facing two more full circuits now, a total of 50 kilometres to go. And again, Lotto Bellasol controlling the race, along with, as it has been all day, with Argos Shimano, thinking of their sprinters. There's the clock on the left, counting it through. They go through at about 2 minutes and 11 seconds. They'll be fairly happy with that because they know they can pull back a, a couple of minutes quite quickly once they start to pick up the pace in the main field. The peloton here as they go through the hydration station and uh, what a good name it is for that place because it is important in temperatures like this to keep yourself topped up with fluids. Riders on a day like today can very easily get through uh, between three and five litres of liquid. They'll take two different kinds of liquid on board as well, Phil. Uh, very often uh, we'll have water, but they'll also have an isotonic drink to keep the mi minerals topped up. And it's also a good place uh, to pick up some souvenirs because these guys are not throwing away rubbish. Those bottles that are being thrown to the side of the road, they'll be picked up very quickly by the guys who've uh, massed after the feeding station. Bet your life, and they're brand new, of course. The only time they get used. Now, let's have a look what's in today. 2.05, well, we've just seen 2.11, so 
we know that's wrong already, don't we? But it is an indication it's on the way down. Coming across the vineyards of South Australia, we are finding the peloton that now left the town of Lobethal for the first time. Another passage through there before the finish. Uh, 50 kilometres or more or less to go now as the riders continue. This is the L'Oreal Men Expert opening day of the Santos Tour Down Under. 135 kilometres between Prospect and Lobethal. One man has led it all day, Jordan Kirby, taken all the prizes so far. Uh, but he's dangling two minutes plus in front of the riders. Two teams riding very closely together, cohesively, uh, Lotto Belisol and, of course, Argo Shimano. They will wait, I think, Phil, until the final lap. Uh, they'll leave this young man out to, uh, to fry in the midday sun, to uh, start to weaken, and he'll get pulled back just basically by the war and the speed of attrition in the main peloton later on. Oh, now, those people I know very well indeed, they run an a, a animal sanctuary mainly for wallabies and kangaroos where the parents have been killed in road traffic ac accidents. This is Joey, and looking at him, I would say he's just about a little less than a year old, and Mum is making sure he's safe and sound here. Now, we were talking to Andy Sleck the other day. He'd only been here a day. He saw his first koala. I wonder if he's seen at the start, the, well, at the finish at the moment, I wonder if he's seen this lovely picture of the wallaby. Well, he thought it was just normal, and uh, I know a lot of Australians who've uh, spent an awful long time uh, waiting to see their first koala. In fact, uh, Andy st he saw the sign for the koalas at the side of the road. He stopped there, <laughs> looked up into the, uh, into the eucalyptus trees, and then all of a sudden, he said there were five koalas there. Yeah, they don't exactly fall all over the place. You really do have to search. I was two years before I saw my first koala. I think you were only a couple of days, weren't you? Absolutely. I thought they put the signs up there for advertising. I just stopped at the side of the road, looked up into the trees where they'd been stripping off the bark, and there was one sitting quite nice and pretty up at the top. And they can make a big noise when they're mating, I'll tell you that as we watch Jordan Kirby here take a drink. Four kilometres back into Charleston for the second time. That'll, uh, so we're running it around about 88 kilometres covered, just on 46 kilometres to go. And for him, uh, it will take uh, around about an hour, but I have a feeling uh, the main field will pick up their pace to in excess of 50 kilometres an hour on the way towards the finish. In fact, just looking at them once again here, Phil, they're starting to get themselves organised, and I would think the sprinters a little bit surprised by uh, Simon Gerrans popping out of the pack uh, last time we came through Charleston to pick himself up a two-second time bonus. Now, the guys who want to win this bike race overall have to be very attentive, especially for a rider like Simon Gerrans that uh, grabs a couple of seconds here and there five kilometers to go for the main field they're separated by a kilometer which would be right just over two minutes between the two of them so they haven't picked up anything since they came through Lobethal and it doesn't look as though they've tried to we'll see just how serious Gerens is if he, if he comes through again to try and snatch the two seconds available bonus to the peloton then the, the potential winners of this tour should start to take notice throughout history this tour is usually won by a few seconds. It is a hillier course this year, uh, but let me remind you that last year, Gerens beat Alejandro Valverde of Spain, and they were equal on time. It was only on stage wins and positions that got the nod to Gerens. Yes, the count back uh, gave it to Simon Gerens. A very nervous final day around Adelaide for uh, Gerens and their Orica Green Edge, getting themselves uh, their first big victory in a team that was born just last year. Right away from the Frenchman on the Dutch team, uh, Thierry Dupont. Now watch out for the dark black blue, uh, blue jerseys there with the uh, lime green logo on. That's the Spanish team Movistar. Uh, their sprinter, uh, JJ Rojas, is a very fast sprinter. If it comes down towards the end, and he's had a fair amount of success in the, uh, uh, in the Santos Tour Down Under in the past, and they'll be looking to try and get him towards the, uh, the front once this race speeds up on the run into town for the final time. He has. He won the cycling speed best young rider of this race in 2008-2009. Doesn't qualify that for, qualify for that anymore. He's got a, that little bit older, but he is a very fast sprinter. And the stage winning is certainly not out of the question. You see, Paul, I think they are stepping up the pace here, but then they are being drawn towards the Jayco sprint now in Charleston. 
Yes, I wonder if the sprinters will have a crack at that. Uh, because of the difficulty of tomorrow's stage with uh, Corkscrew Hill coming down towards the end, I wonder if the sprinters will be really concerned about trying to get the overall lead on day one or whether they'll think just merely about trying to win the stage. Time trial position here of a man who can ride a very, very solid time trial. He surprised us all at Williamstown, which is in the state of Victoria, just on the other side of the bay from Melbourne. Uh, Hobson's Bay, and uh, he won the prologue time trial of the uh, Jaco Herald Sun Tour the other week. Uh, surprised everybody. He was an early starter, and he sat there watching and waiting. He saw the big names, many of those big names now with their teams here in this race, come and go, and he survived to the end to take the first leader's jersey. So uh, he can ride a good time trial. Well, he obviously was planning a good move here this afternoon as well, because you look at the choice of his wheels. The wheels there have got a very deep uh, carbon fiber rim to them. That gives them uh, a bit of aerodynamics, not as aerodynamic as maybe the solid wheel at the back in an individual time trial would give you, but it also gives you a fair amount of rigidity in the wheels as well. They don't have as many spokes as uh, they used to have 15 and 20 years ago, when you would have uh, 32 spokes in the front or 36 in the back. Nowadays, you can get down to 20, especially with these much deeper rims. Been pretty solid. He hasn't faltered at all. He's going no faster or slower. It's the peloton who are going faster and slower, and that's why he's yo-yoing. He's just keeping a, a very sensible speed here, knowing this race doesn't end today. It ends next Sunday back in Adelaide. So it's a veritable tour now of the Barossa Valley, uh, the McLaren Vale, the vineyards, Adelaide Hills, and Adelaide itself before we roll to a halt on Sunday mentioned a little bit earlier, Phil, that a lot of the riders on Lotto Bellisol are actually riding with uh, one-piece uh, skin suits on. But in fact, a number of riders on the Argos Shimano team have done the same thing. It's probably because it's a fairly short race uh, for the majority of these riders. They're not too concerned about carrying uh, lots and lots of food. Well, looking down there at the man with the white cross on his back, well, that's Martin Kohler. One rider glad to be back at the Tour Down Under. Well, uh, last year I had a pretty good start with uh, two days in the leaders' jersey, and uh, this year, yeah, of course, uh, it would be nice to have it again. This race is always, it's, it's a lot with time bonifications, deciding at the end, okay, since last year and also this year it will be different with the Milonga top hill finish, and this year I think it's even more challenging with uh, the corkscrew and also the Sterling stage will be more hard, so uh, I think this year the time bonification is not that important as other years before. Well, we'll find out. A little bit of a flurry there while we were listening to Martin Kohler, the champion of Switzerland, as uh, Jens Voigt tried to liven things up, approaching Charleston, as he did the previous time. Well, although Martin Kohler was saying he didn't think the time bonuses were going to be quite that important this year, you can see him there, number 13. He's being very attentive at the front end of the main field. Number 47, Jens Voigt, he started that flurry of activity, and now he's just uh, slipped into the middle of the arrowhead of the peloton as he waits to see how this sprint unfolds. See, he wears uh, his superstition. He cancelled out by wearing one of his number 13s upside down. That was something started by Fabian Cancellara, the great uh, Swiss time trialist a few years ago. Through the finish at the Jayco Spin, second time, 92.6 kilometres covered. Another three seconds time bonus for Jordan Kirby. So that means, uh, notwithstanding his time gap over the field, if they all finish together, he'll have an advantage of six seconds over the field. Style is starting to look a little bit more laboured now as he moves forward onto his saddle. That's always an indication that the rider is starting to lose a bit of power. But for him, uh, that's not too much of his concern. He's showed off his jersey to the uh, television viewers from around the world. He got himself maximum points in the first King of the Mountains point over Checker Hill. That's a second category climb. And he will wear the Skoda King of the Mountains jersey tomorrow. But look at this sprint now starting to get itself wound up. And the riders on the far side are the Blanco squad, maybe trying to set it up for Mark Renshaw. Well, here's the charge now for second place. Team BMC are leading up, and they're really going for this one. Look at the gaps that's opened up uh, with the main pedals on now as they try to rip up this. Martin Kohler, who just told us he's not interested in time bonuses, is leading out Philippe Gilbert here on his back wheel, but there's a rush coming from Orica Green Edge as they've got the inside lane, and this time it is Daniel Impey who's trying to lead out Simon Clark and followed by Simon Gerrans. Gerrans is really interested in this sprint. He's on the far left of 
of the road. Rockas making a run for Movistar in the middle in that dark jersey. Well, this is a real sprint, and on the line, it has gone through to Movistar, I think. Well, I've got a funny well, feeling it, no, it was I mean, back on Soleil, it came right Soleil. up at the very last moment. It was Rojas in the dark blue jersey right in the middle and wearing number 101, yep. finished on the podium in the Giro <laughs> d'Italia last year, Thomas de Gent. Thomas de Gent, there he is. He won on the Stelvio in the Giro d'Italia last year, which is the 20th stage of the race, and he finished third. Paul, this was a pretty active race for just a couple of seconds. Well, that's what these guys realise. This race can very, very often be decided by seconds. And again, going across the line in fourth place there, number one, Simon Gerrans, very, very attentive. But a very good burst to the line, a last-minute surge by Thomas de Gent, just getting ahead of JJ Rojas in the dark blue jersey of Movistar. Well, that was a very intensive win there, he thought, for Simon Goins. He had two guys, Dal Impey and uh, Simon Clark, leading him out, but the boys proved a bit too quick as he tried to come through on the inside, uh, and he got nothing in the end. So Jordan Kirby has taken two. There's one more visit to Charleston to come, and then it will be heading to the finish. Just a little rub of the nose there, probably to get the little blob of sweat off it, because this is the man who has led the stage all day today, Jordan Kirby. He swept all before him, he's won all of the prizes. I never like it when the camera pulls back, Paul, because we're going to see Jerome Pino on the right of our picture about to cross the gap. There's not very much more than uh, 10 or 15 seconds. And in fact, uh, Jerome Pino is stretching out the advantage here over the main field, because I estimate that to be around about 30 seconds back to the peloton. I don't think he'll out, out fox the uh, sprinters, though, Phil. There are so many sprinters in this year's race, so therefore there are so many teams of sprinters who will be prepared to set a real sterling pace on the last lap of this course. I could see the Frenchman making a move like this. This is not a flat circuit. You saw him sprint up that little rise there. As the continuation now, we we'll just take a look at the contour map here. You'll see that it really isn't uh, a course with um, flat roads on it. It's up and down all the time in the Adelaide Hills. There it is, like a little row of back teeth on the shark. We've gone through two S's now. They're the two sprints. There's one more visit to Charleston to come, and then we head down towards the finish in Lobethal. We've got to go through the finishing line once more as well. Yes, but it's on the run in towards the finishing line. That's the hardest part of the circuit, and that's the part of the circuit that the uh, sprinters will be a little bit concerned about. Guys like uh, Andre Greipel, they'll try and ride at the front end of the main field because they know they'll slip back down through the peloton as they go over those long drags, but they will want to try and stay in contact and then have their teammates pace them back up to the front just before the finish. And as we can see here, the catch is about to happen. Turning right in Woodside as they go up that hill which hangs in front. And uh, Jordan Kirby, for the first time in just on two and a half hours, he's going to have company. And I think he won't be strong enough to try and help go forward with Jerome Pino. Let's see, Pino takes a look at him and uh, likewise returned. Now he, look at that, Paul, it, the youngster's digging in. Well, he knows uh, never give up, and especially when we get caught by a tough professional by rider like Jérôme Pinot, who turned professional way back in 2002. You uh, stick with that rider for as long as possible. All he needs is a, a, a kilometre or so to recover, and he might well be able to go over the top of this climb in contact with Pinot. Well, now uh, Kirby sitting on the back wheel of a man who's won one of the biggest uh, stages of a stage race in the world, a Grand Tour stage win in the Tour of Italy back in 2010. Chance to learn a little bit more. Two riders are clear, but the gap is around about 30 seconds. Well, I'll tell you one thing, Phil, uh, just looking at the young Australian there, he really is starting to suffer. You can see he looked over his shoulder to see over. the position of the main field, and then he thought, oh, I think I'll wait for them. Wise decision. There's no point in selling all your energy. This is a six-day race. There's no point in using all of your energy up right at this moment in time. The race itself is just under 900 kilometres in length. It's about 550 miles. Well, Jordan Kirby uh, slipping back there. You can see how strong uh, this man Pino is. He'll want to try and build uh, a good minute or so if he's got any hope of trying to survive. But in the peloton, as we sit at the back end of the peloton here, Phil, they haven't yet started to organise their chase. 
Oh, well, they feel they've done enough to keep the race under control. They've only got 36 kilometres to go, but they'll be aware of that. Uh, but what they're waiting for is to get under that finish banner in Lobethal when they'll get a bell uh, for the last 25 kilometres. So there are just 11 kilometres from that. And two and three quarter hours has passed under the wheels now. A change of leader for the first time. Jerome Pino of France and the Amiga Farmer Quick Step team, which is based in Belgium, by the way, one of the world's best teams. And uh, you've got to be good to get a contract on this team, I'll tell you. Well, in fact, uh, their uh, big one of their other big leaders, alongside Mark Cavendish, uh, Tom Bonin, was uh, rushed into hospital uh, just over the weekend because he got uh, an infection in his elbow, and uh, that uh, required some pretty serious hospital treatment. Hopefully, he'll get back to the form he had last year because Tom Bonin had a brilliant season last year, winning uh, a couple of the big cobbled classics in the month of April, something that he specialises in. And he'll be looking forward to that again, Paris Roubaix, etc. This is the way to relax on the way downhill here, Bernie Eisel. <laughs> Funny enough, uh, when we're looking at the uh, the, uh, the race list of riders the other day, he was uh, listed down as a German rider. So mm. I had a bit of a giggle with him uh, in the uh, in the lobby of the Hilton. I asked him uh, when he changed from Austrian to German. He says, no, no, I'm still Austrian. Yes, he says, my number's correct. My country has changed. Uh, he's referring to his racing license number. So, all together, one rider clear. It's a change, but will he stay away? Looking down again to the vineyards as we return uh, slowly but surely to Lobethal now and what will be the final 25 kilometres of the day. Still out in front is uh, Jerome Pino, but the peloton are keeping him in their sights. He's just seeing just if he makes any progress right now, the Frenchman, who won stage five of the Giro d'Italia back in 2010. This is the opening stage of the L'Oreal Men Expert opening day in the Santos Tour Down Under. 135 kilometers in total. And they've got just about 35 kilometres still to race. And the time gap, he's pushed it out. 65 seconds. Kirby, he had to leave behind. He was getting too tired, the youngster from the UniSA squad. Well, this is a good part of the course uh, for the man we're looking at here, Jérôme Pinot. It's uh, the lumpy part of the course. The sprinters won't want to push it at this point because uh, they will just want to survive and get over the top of the climb and then trying to find their position at the front end of the main field when we come round to this point in the course next time round. Now, the team car stopped on the left. Just seeing if we pull back, we can see exactly what one minute relates to on the road there's the peloton and uh, Kirby Jordan Kirby didn't see him in the gap so he must be back in the peloton now and he's probably hoping this race ends uh, quite quickly let's just take you through the story so far we left this morning uh, for at 11 o'clock local from Prospect just outside of Adelaide as soon as the flag was pulled in at the end of the neutralized section one man was seen up the road and this was Jordan Kirby the under-23 champion of Australia, over the top of the only climb of the day, Checker Hill, after 26 miles or 42 kilometres. Uh, so he's got the points, he uh, got the King of the Mountains there for Skoda, he'll wear that jersey tomorrow. As they approach Charleston, where Kirby was going through there for a small-time bonus, the pursuit was by Jens Voigt. He didn't make it, the field wiped him up, and surprisingly, what's the left of your picture here? And then on the right, it switched there as we see Simon Gerrans, last year's defending champion, take a two-second bonus. He had a lead of a minute and a half, though, as the field tried again, heading into Charleston for the second time with one more visit to come. Absolute ripper in the race for second place, though, and the man on the left showing a clean pair of wheels to the sprinter Rockhas is Thomas de Ghent of Vacon Soleil. He got second, Rockhas got third, Simon Gerrans got fourth. But what it does do, Phil, is it showed you how serious these riders are taking the time bonus points. This was a little bit earlier as well when uh, you saw Jérôme Pinot had caught and passed the lone leader, lone leader uh, Jordan Kirby, back in the main field now. Hopefully he can stay in the main field all the way down to the finish line. And the Frenchman has soloed on to around about a one minute and five second advantage. Probably isn't enough, but uh, he's on a very, very good team that will try and defend for him. That'll be, he'll try and break up the pace, making the, making the rhythm, perhaps, of Lotto Bellasson as we 
show you the trace of the route here now. We're not far outside. We've just come through Woodside, which is where the capture was made, and then they climb that steep hill out of Woodside. Now we're heading to Lobethal and the start of the last lap. We get into Lobethal just over 25 kilometres from the finish, uh, so they're about five or six kilometres out of town at the moment, three and a half miles. Well, 31 kilometres to go to the finish line. That's around about 19 miles of racing. I think Lotto turning it off a fraction now. They probably feel quite confident uh, that uh, once they get themselves organised on the running towards the finish, they can pull back that lone leader quite quickly. On the left-hand side of the road, you can see a lot of dark blue jerseys. That's Garmin Sharp. I wonder today whether they'll be uh, setting up the sprinter for their Australian rider or whether it's going to be for their, their big man, and that, of course, is Tyler Farah. That's a good point. One minute 15, he's still nudging here, uh, Pino. Uh, we'll get a, a very accurate one as we pass under the banner with one lap to go. Steel Van Hoff is sprinting very, very well. Tyler Farah, having come from his home city of Seattle, will probably find he's a little bit ring rusty and it might take him a couple of days to settle into the warmth of South Australia. This is the lone leader, 33 years of age. Well, when you look at the uh, the list of riders, uh, Robin McCune had told us earlier that he thinks Steel Van Hoff could be the dark horse here this afternoon, but he's coming up against some of the best sprinters in the world. Andre Greipel uh, is the man on everybody's uh, lips who's the man to beat on today's stage, but he's up against Matty Goss of Australia. CJ Sutton's right up there. Mark Renshaw and Graham Brown, that's a good uh, two-man pronged attack there for yeah. Team Blanco. And, of course, Marcel Kittel, I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't come close to Andre Greipel here this afternoon because his team look very, very solid around him. Great sprinters all, and uh, they're keeping the powder dry at the moment, but it'll all change once they get through Lobethal and start their final circuit of the Adelaide Hills here in the Onkaparinga Onca Valley. That is Argos Shimano. That's the white jersey with the uh, little blue bands around the uh, sleeves there. That's Argos Shimano uh, setting the pacemaking once they've come to the front. Second position there is Bernie Eisel. And never very far away from the front of the peloton is always a rider from Lotto Bellisol. And just behind him is Luke Durbridge. So the teams of the three big sprinters in this race have got pretty much control, a stranglehold on the peloton currently. These are the teammates to the riders there, just uh, resting in the pack, as it were, because tomorrow we go up the Corkscrew Hill, which is a real tough one. And as we look here now, one likely man, you know, who could win uh, the race today is uh, Matthew Goss, who is the firepower of the Orica Green Edge team. It's uh, a long way from straight forward, you know. It's uh, quite quite undulating, that final lap. Uh, Ten kilometres to go to five kilometres to go is quite hard, actually, and... Uh, you know, I don't think we're going to see a full bunch of, you know, the whole peloton arriving there for the sprint. And then again, when you come to the finish, you've got that tricky little uphill, about a kilometre and a half to go. Shoot down to the last corner, about 400, and it starts to drag back up. So, you know, it's definitely going to be one that's going to take, you know, perfect timing almost. And, uh, you know, it, it is important to know these roads. If you don't know this, then, you know, it, it's, it's going to make it very hard to judge where, where you should be going, where you should be starting your sprint and where you should be in the peloton. Matthew will be looking for this. He got the second place on Sunday in the opening circuit race to Greipel, and he's hoping to climb one notch higher. He said this morning, a Tasmanian rider, but he knows these roads very well from his days with the national squad. So he's been to Lobethal many times uh, in training. I'm just looking through the valley here. A little bit dry off to the left there, but they keep watering the vines, everything else is a bit dry, a little bit of a wry smile there from uh, Bernard Eisel. Used to be the lead-out man for Mark Cavendish. Uh, he's going to miss Mark this year, Mark having won already today down in Argentina, and Bernard now having to fill other places within the Sky team. Well, one of the reasons uh, Mark, Cav Mark Cavendish uh, pretty much... Uh, uh, but I'm just having a look to see who that is. That's Bernie Eisel's, I think. And um, as you can see, Eisel written down the uh, side of his jersey there. Uh, one of the reasons Bernie Eisel probably didn't follow Mark Cavendish was because he was still under contract and there was a mm. big negotiation to release Mark Cavendish from the contract because of the, the fact that uh, he, he feels he wants to go to the Tour de France to try and win stages and Team Sky's philosophy is to go to the Tour de France and try and win overall and it's very difficult to go to the Tour de France these days and have two objectives, to have a sprinter and somebody going for the overall standing. Yeah. So Cavendish said, I'm out of here and I bet he really, really would have liked to take Bernie Eisel with him. 
Now, as we go through here, we've already seen a wallaby, albeit uh, being rehabilitated. The Adelaide Hills around this part of the world abound with wildlife. That's a rainbow lorikeet. Keep your eyes peeled for these birds, marsupials, and, of course, reptiles. Or visit one of the great wildlife parks, feed the native animals, and get up close and personal with kangaroos and, of course, koalas. This is a wild place, it is a beautiful place, and this man will be just happy to see Lobethal again, and then he knows he's on his final lap of 25 kilometers. Jerome Pino, he took over the lead in Woodside, and he's now hoping now that he can hold on to the end. It's a big ask, but it's not impossible. The riders are in Lobethal now. The leader, Jerome Pino, went through. We'll tell you exactly how far ahead in just a moment as the riders continue now to go up through the finishing line. Being driven on by the teams of the sprinters, as we see under the banner there, the gap on the left, they brought it back. As they go through now, just about a minute and 10 seconds is the gap. And a chance to uh, last moments of uh, s snatching the uh, feeding bottles here. And I'm delighted to welcome alongside me new. Now, fresh off the course, is Robbie McEwen. Robbie, you won 12 stages of this race. Are you about to wave goodbye to that record? Or are you going to have to share it today with Andre Greipel, do you think? Well, I think you'd have to be mad not to install uh, Andre as the favourite for today. But the other sprinters of a little bit different type, your, your Matt Gosh, your Boston Hagen, CJ Sutton, they are presented with a very real opportunity to take it to Andre today. It's not just this rise and finish line, but this local circuit. You just saw the climb where Pinot went away and created mm. a gap. It's actually very tough, and it might be a good thing for guys like Matt Goss that there's a bit of attacking, that the race really lights up and takes the sting out of Andre Greipel's legs. Because to beat a guy who's clearly the fastest, you need to do everything you can. Well, Robbie, um, uh, most people might not know that Robbie's been brought in as the uh, the team coach for sprinting when it comes down to Orica Green Edge. Now, you were always very meticulous when you prepared the Tour de France, for example. You even went back and looked at a lot of the old videos to see how the races were won, how races were lost. What will have you said to uh, Matt Goss? Bear in mind, I don't think any of the team managers are listening at the moment, so I'm sure you can spill the beans. There's certainly only a phone call away these days, so I won't give away too much. But uh, the tactic today is to, to ride off his teammates. We've got uh, guys uh, in Jens Morris and Daryl Impey, who are very good lead-out men, but they are up against the very powerful and well-drilled Lotto Bellisol team of Andre Greipel. Mm. Greg Henderson is just... He's become a real master of leading out the sprint. So I think they're going to have to ride off them. But like I said, it'd be good if they can take the sting out of Greipel's legs a bit because a dragging sprint like today's is very suitable to Matt Goss's qualities. Yeah, but I did notice that uh, two teams uh, in particular, uh, Garmin, uh, Argos Shimano and Lotto Bellisol, a lot of the guys on that team, they're actually wearing skin suits today. Is that because it's a shorter stage or is it because they think they need that extra advantage of aerodynamics? Guys seem to be going for that uh, marginal gains, as the phrase was coined by the Sky team. So looking at every single detail with the, the time trial suits, what we call the skin suits, the, uh, the closed-in helmets or a helmet cover to make them even more aerodynamic. Myself, I was a bit old school. I wouldn't go towards the skin suit, I believe, in a, just a good tight jersey. But, uh, you know, if it's going to come down to a millimetre and you lose by that, you may sit back and wonder, should I have put that helmet cover on or should I have worn a skin suit? Now, we're looking at Luke Durbridge... Uh... What do you think of this guy? He's the new Aussie time trial champ, the new Aussie road race champ. He's got just about everything to be a real star, hasn't he? He's got it all there to be a real star. He's very, very young and he's, he's at a, a fantastic level and he's really established himself after just one year in the pro peloton. He won eight races in his first year as a, a neo-pro, a first-year professional. Mm. The last guy that came out and won races... Uh, maybe eight or ten races in the first season was Peter Sagan. Before him, Mark Cavendish, and before him was myself. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, is what I want to say. And Durbo being able to do that as a non-sprinter, that's just a sign of, of what's to come over the next few years. And what about that uh, crafty little move, though, by Simon Gerrans? They were lining themselves up for the first sprint point, and it looked as if it was going to go to the sprinters, and then Simon Gerrans pops out and gets himself a two-second time bonus. That could be important towards the end of this six days of racing. I tell you what, Gero knows better than anybody this race comes down to the very last second, equal time last year, and you know that a two-second or a four-second time bonus can make a world of difference. Well, just over three hours in the saddle for the rides there. Nice, gentle easing into six days in the saddle. 
and almost 900 kilometers of pedaling the first big tour of the year anywhere in the world the first world tour event and trying to be won today by a Frenchman Jerome Pino he's got just 22 kilometers to go that's about 13 miles and I'm not sure he's gonna hold them all off is he bought uh, Robbie no with that sort of lead with another half an hour of racing to go and the sprinters teams that know they've got limited opportunities in this race they're not going to let it go they'll just reel him in slowly but surely the sprinters teams will want to just pull him back gradually and hope that he's maybe just still in front on that last climb which is really quite tough uh, they don't want too much action the team of, of Greipel the other pure sprinters uh, is this it's a, a good launch pad. Rob, do you think a distraction because Amigo got two good sprinters on the squad, Andrew Fenn, Kurt Stegmans? Well, they realise they don't have a full sprint team here, so other guys get the opportunity to go out and take their chances, and uh, if they are brought back, they can have their sprinters uh, really have a crack at it. But without a full train, then you might as well just try throwing everything at the, the powerful teams that are in control of the race. For the moment, he's still starting to stretch out that advantage a little bit, though, because it's a minute and a quarter. He is an experienced bike rider, Jérôme Pino. He's been around for a long time, turned professional in 2002, rode the Tour de France 11 times. If they're not very attentive, I think, personally, I think the best place to catch it would be at around about 10 to go once they've started to get over towards the summit of the climb, because it negates any counter-attacks coming from the main field. That's right. He's certainly a guy they shouldn't underestimate. Uh, he's got a lot of experience. He's done this sort of thing before. He's won a stage in the Giro. Uh, but by the look of this bunch, they're certainly not underestimating him. They are really moving. And like you say, to pull him back at a decent speed up the climb to prevent counter-attacks is what uh, a team like Lotto will be looking to do. They seem to be chasing these seconds from the peloton, albeit racing for second place in the two second ones. I think Pino will stay away to Charleston now. He's just on four kilometres, just inside four kilometres from Charleston, uh, but they really are racing these two second time bonus sprints. They are, you saw before Thomas de Ken from the Vacanceleo team, third in last year's Giro d'Italia and the winner of the stage over the Stelvio, he went out there and, and nabbed a few seconds uh, in the second intermediate. Very often in the past those uh, intermediate sprint points have been ignored. Well, the riders are all together, they're heading to Charleston and there's still one man in the lead. Just a mile or one and a half kilometers now to race to the uh, sprint point in Charleston, taking us through 118 kilometers of the 135 of the day. The peloton are also in full flight now. They seem convinced they want to fight out the second place. They've got Pino in their sights. He'll probably hang on for the three second bonus. But after that, I think they're going to catch him. Well, I'll tell you what, that's not one minute and 15 seconds no anymore. It's down to around about 45 seconds. This is the uh, important part for the main field. Now, once they start to see their prey, they'll back off a fraction, uh, as Robbie said a little earlier. They will want to time where they catch the, this uh, lone leader here, and they'll leave him out there to stew for a little bit longer. It's not important to catch him now. They'll probably wait for another four or five kilometres. Just over 10 miles to go, uh, Robbie, and they've got... Do you think they'll let Pino take that three seconds, or are they going to sweep him up? Well, I think they're not too bothered if they, they sweep him up for those few seconds or not, but uh, I think once they do lead out the sprint for the second place, they will roll right onto his back wheel. Yeah. Like we said before, they're not going to be able to leave the catch till later, and it does open the race up to another counter-attack. Well, you see Gilbert, <laughs> he's heading out like Jens Voigt did in the, the first intermediate sprint there, just trying to steal a few champion. seconds. The uh, world champion he, flying and looking for two seconds here it could be invaluable. Well, you know, in the in the previous sprint, he was mixing it up there. He was actually led out by his teammates to try and go and get a couple of seconds there. He's ridden well in the Santos Tour Down Under in the past, and at this is Philippe Gilbert, I think, at his best. He's come here with good form. He's not only he said in the press he was thinking about possibly a podium finish. I think he might even be thinking about winning this bike race overall. In the past visits here, he's won the best young rider. He's won the King of the Mountains, and he has also finished fourth overall and he knows this event can be decided literally by one second heading up to the third and final Jayco sprint of the day for the points and Jerome Pino is the man who's going to take the three second time bonus and the points uh, for the leaders jersey the blue jersey in the Jayco sprint competition uh, but I think once he gets through here 
we're going to see the field come all together as they line up for the finishing logo. Oh, my goodness me, he's not even going to get the three seconds. What a sprint finish. He got right across Philippe Gilbert, right on the line, swipes the bonus and gets the three points. I've got to Six say, points. Robbie, you've been a professional bike rider for a long time, but that was a bit of class, wasn't oh, it? Oh, that is super class. It's also a bit of a blunder by Jerome Pinot. All he had to do was push the pedals two more times, a little bit hard, but you see Gilbert. That's the sort of thing that makes you world champion. You, you make the most of every situation and the guy has got enormous power to, you saw other people try this same move to leave the peloton take some seconds couldn't make it happen Gilbert's yeah. got that bit extra and he's got the bit extra on top of the bit extra he Peter certainly looked over his shoulder to wonder where the rest of the race was he didn't realize he'd come across by himself well I'm not, we've got to talk about the sprint for today because it's uh, pretty obvious it's going to come down to a bunch sprint but uh, Robbie I haven't been and had a look at this uh, corkscrew hill tomorrow that's the sort of climb that Philippe Gilbert that's really Philippe Gilbert's forte isn't it something like that that could have for him as well as taking three seconds putting himself in contention for GC because every second counts that's a little bit of a, a general repetition for tomorrow I mean, expect to see him at the, the top part of the corkscrew really lighting things up. And he's done it so many times in so many races. Guys know he's going to do it, but the guy is so strong and he's so good. All they can do is watch him go. So it'll be very interesting tomorrow. Well, this is where we are, and we're heading towards the, the chequered flag now. There's no more prizes, no more time bonuses along the route, but the man that wins will receive a 10-second time bonus, six and four for the other two riders. Uh, so it still could go the way of the winner, the Oka jersey, tomorrow. Tell you one thing, that was a very class move by Philippe Gilbert. He jumped across around about a 30-second gap to get himself to Pino and get himself that three-second time bonus. I think he's come to this race this year with some serious intentions. 15 kilometres to go to the finish. Now that's inside of 10 miles, and yet we haven't got the full organisation. Really, you want to start the uh, organised uh, sprint train a little bit closer to the finish because you want to keep as many guys together as possible, don't you, until you've got your last two or three men to go into the final two kilometres. Forming a sprint train and a successful sprint train is not so much about how long you're on the front, but it's having control over the race, control over the peloton, being where you want to be. If others come past you and, and ride what you think is too fast to reach the finish, you slot in, you use them up, you go back to the front and just keep it in a way that you can rate, reach all the way to the finish line with your team. But I don't think we're going to see a, a straightforward run into this finish. They're coming to this final climb and it looked tough the last time around with Pinot. I think there's just it's going to provide a springboard for attacks. Now let's just go through what we've got. There's a change of guard here. The far right of the Blanco team. They've got potential sprint winners there, Mark Renshaw, perhaps even Graham Brown. The Astana team have forced themselves. They were the the uh, light colour blue jersey that have come forward. They've got uh, Guadini, who is a terrific sprinter and always seems to have form at this time of the year. And they've moved him up. So they, I'm getting the impression a lot of these riders uh, have got used to this circuit. They know where they've got to make the move and it's on this hill Robbie's talking about. But uh, the, the bad thing about a sprinter and having a, a really lumpy run in towards the finish like that is you've got to start that climb at the front in the first five or ten places. I have to submit, I've seen Robin McEwen do that on a number of occasions, start in the first four or five places and slowly slip back to about uh, 15th and 20th and then you've got to get the teammates to get you back up to the front before you come down to the flat part in the sprint. It's what I like to call the drift and it's all about saving energy. If guys are attacking, accelerating up a climb like that, you try to find a regular place a regular pace one that doesn't burn your legs you don't get the build-up of lactic acid so you ride at your own pace while keeping yourself in the peloton and quite often the move back towards the front on the other side of the hill is much easier than trying to keep up going up the hill so it's all about conversation of energy a lot of a lot of psychology going on here as well now because uh, those white jerseys that'll be uh, Argos Shimano where uh, they'll be trying to sort the sprint out for their man uh, Marcel Kittel and uh, if anybody can get around Andre Greipel today I would think that he's got a very good chance to do it. There's a few teams getting themselves organised here and the most impressive at the moment is the arrival of the Blanco team. They've got sprinters in Mark Renshaw, likely lead out man would be Graham Brown. Uh, they've got some workers. These are the riders on the left of our picture. And the first time we've seen them up here all day, Edvard Boisenhagen in the red jersey is also beginning to intrude near the front as well. He rides on the Sky team. 
This is beginning to take a very interesting shape. What we have seen on this opening stage today is there are a lot of riders who've paid attention to small time bonuses uh, because they're thinking of winning this race in the six days time. They know this race by history is only ever won by seconds gained. Well, look at number 57 down there for Garmin Sharma. That's a man uh, very early on in the day was tipped by Robbie McEwen as uh, a possible dark horse for the sprint. He's got a good turn of speed. He certainly does, and he had a very good national championships in uh, in Ballarat down at Bunningyong there on a, a super tough circuit. He ran, I believe he was, oh, was it fourth, uh, third, actually, so just behind Michael Matthews. And, you know, that for me is a great show of form. And on a tough little run-in like this, I, th I think they have quite good legs at the finish. Mm. One thing I must say is teams and riders sort of starting their run from now, just inside 15 kilometres to go, I think they're starting way too early. You don't see the train of no, Lotto. Robbie, you don't see the boys of Orica just yet. We commentate on you winning 12 stages of the Tour de France at this stage of the race towards the finish. We would never have seen you, would we? Some, uh, so who should we look for? There's a sharp right turn coming up here. Uh, so it's somebody we can't see who's going to Yeah, win, right? I guess you, you could say uh, you should be looking for the guy you won't see. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yeah. the important thing. The important thing is not to ride at the front at 15 kilometres to go. As Robbie said, you've got to conserve as much energy as possible when you're a sprinter. You've got to hide away from the wind. The wind is your enemy until the last possible moment. And if you can have the wind in your face for only 200 metres and it's the last 200 metres, that's what you're aiming for. So in this situation, I would always love to see guys at the front going as hard as they can, catching a bit of wind and wasting energy, because I knew at the, the tail end of the race, where the prizes are given out, that was going to come back and bite them. Well, the Movistar team, that's the dark jersey on the front at the moment, they're looking after Rojas, who's twice won the best young rider competition in this event. He's a very, very fast sprinter, loves coming to this event, and uh, always leaves an impression. They're looking to guide him for the victory today. The Astana boys, those lighter blue jerseys, almost turquoise. They're looking to bring uh, Guardini, Andrea Guardini, to the line first. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, the boys from Lotto Bellasol and Argo Shimano have found there's a lot more guys interested in winning the race than they thought. Well, watch out for this man. Don't give him too much of an advantage because, as Robbie said, this is a lumpy part of the course. This man is a former time trial champion of Spain, a former road race champion of Spain, Jose Ivan Gutierrez. And if he gets 30 seconds over the top, he'll be pretty hard to pull back. Well, I think he's actually looking more to just set a pace that's going to hurt the pure sprinters. I saw him just look back over his shoulder and just wind it back a notch. Uh, Rojas from the Movistar team is a very good sprinter, but he's also a very competent climber. We've seen him run in the top three overall at this race before. He will be looking with his team to make this climb quite tough, try and just take the sting out of the legs of Greipel and Kittel, which can move him up a position, maybe up to the top step of the podium at the finish line. Yes, he's one of those uh, very rare sprinters who can actually climb uh, quite quite well and survives uh, when it goes down to a group of uh, 25 or 30. But he does have uh, the speed to rival some of the top men. But again, Team Sky, they're very, very clever. They, they saw that move come. And as you said, Robert, you don't react immediately to an acceleration like that. You just slowly bring it up as if you're getting a turbo into, uh, into fifth gear and, and drag yourself back up to a breakaway group. That's right, but also Sky with uh, Chris Sutton and Edvold Bossenhagen, quite similar to Rockas, don't have the top end of an Andre Greipel or a Marcel Kittel, but they're very good uphill, and I think they'll also be looking for a tough run into this finish. So up this next climb, I think you'll see Sky just try and turn the screws that bit to really make those guys tired, and that uh, puts Edvold Bossenhagen and, and Chris Sutton, who climbs well, in a very strong position for the finish. Well, the last few moments, it's Advantage Sky now. All of those black jerseys, including the white one and the red one, are all Team Sky. The white one is the champion of Great Britain, that's Ian Stannard, and the red one is the champion of Norway, Eddie Boysenhagen, who won this race on points uh, last year. All of those riders are Team Sky, and they've got control. Inside, 10 kilometres to go to the finish. Boysenhagen moves up just one place. They're preparing a lead-out train for him here as they line all the riders up in front. And it's Lotto Bellasol in that yellow shoulder of the jersey at the back who are also beginning now to look for the whereabouts of the gorilla, Andre Greipel. Well, I think Robbie's spot on there. You see uh, Team Lotto, they know they've, they've done this lead-out many, many times before, uh, especially last year. They got it down to a fine art in stages uh, of the Tour de France. They will wait until they get around about five and six kilometres to go and get the maximum number of riders to the front so that they 
can fly into the final two kilometers with three or four riders remaining. But watch out over the next six days of racing for number 11 there, but right alongside in number 21, laboring a little bit on this incline, but keeping himself and holding himself at the front end of the pack. Yeah, so he's looking to just limit the damage. He's uh, staying in the bunch, being conservative. You've got two very different schools of thought here with the Sky and Movistar pushing the pace, trying to really tire out the other sprinters. Lotto Bellisol trying to be conservative, say, OK, fellas, take it to us. We'll just try and sit in the wheel and come back over the top of you later on towards the finish. So we'll see who comes out on top. He's Andy Schleck here, winner of the 2010 Tour de France on the disqualification of Alberto Contador. Twice uh, before has been second, three times the winner of the best young rider in that event. And uh, now he's finding the pure speed here, just a little bit tough at the moment. So he recovers from injury uh, because the sprinters are going to have the day now as they run down towards the finish. Just coming up to eight kilometres or five miles to go. Well, if you put it into perspective where Andy Schleck's concerned, Phil, uh, yes, he did start the Tour of Beijing towards the end of last year, but he really hasn't had any competition since he crashed out of the Dauphiné race last May. So that's a long time to be away from the speed of competition. He's going to have a, a difficult day uh, for the next couple of days, but he'll ride himself into some form in this race. That's what he's hoping for as the season now has started in Australia, as it traditionally does with this first World Tour event of the year all of the top teams are here five miles to go eight kilometers to the finish now the peloton is massing there's a number of teams have indicated to us in these last 10 kilometers that they want to win the stage movistar on the front using harada gutierrez looking to line up Rio, uh, rojas we've got on the left now greipel squad from belgium in those yellow sleeves moving him forward the sky team the white jersey of stanard looking for the whereabouts of edward boysenhagen they all want to win now well you can just see that lotto are doing the job that they know they have to do they're waiting for the right moment when they know that they want to take control they're sitting in the wings they're keeping as much energy as they can for these last few kilometers until all of a sudden Andre Griper will say right guys let's get it started look at the line of the lotto riders there just over to the right hand side all six of them lined up communicating with each other the last rider to be in front of Andre Griper will be the Kiwi Greg Henderson even the Lamprey team are trying to move up here for David Chimele who is the sprinter on the squad all trying to hold position but they're advertising the fact that they want to win. In the black there, the big figure of Matthew Heyman, former Commonwealth Games champion. He's an Australian, but he's in the uh, pay of the Sky team today. And still uh, stepping on the pedals here, the Movistar rider is Jose Herrada, who is setting the pace at the front. And he's giving them some pain. You well, just look the at Stanard hill, there. In, you look at Stanard there in third position in the white jersey, the British national champion. He's rocking and rolling on the front end of his bike just to make sure he stays in contact. And that is exactly what is happening. The Movistar are trying to really, if, if they can, they're trying to asphyxiate the other sprinters to give Rojas a chance. And the other man is Andre Amador of Movistar, but Rojas isn't in the picture yet. They're setting the pace to try and weaken the grip of the sprinters' teams. While hopefully someone else is looking after Rock has, but he hasn't come through our lens just at the moment. He's got a little bit of a ground to make up if he's going to take them on in the sprint. I'm looking over the shoulder, I'm looking to see where is the organisation from Orica Greenedge because with a rough, uh, hard ride into the finish, that should give Matthew Goss a good chance. Let's not forget, in the past, he dragged his body over the Poggio to get himself a victory in the great one-day classic Milan San Remo. Well, a hill like this isn't going to pose much of a problem for Matthew Goss, like you said, through San Remo, over the Cipressa, over the Poggio. I did notice over the top there, Andre Greipel did stay at the front of the field with his teammates, right behind him, Matthew Goss, Mark Renshaw. So all the boys are making sure they stay near the front. It's also for some guys about giving themselves a bit of confidence as we see an attack go from one of the AG2R riders. Yes, and that's the sort of move that we want to see because this rider going clear is, is Bel Kadri from Team AG2R, an ever-present team in this event. They've always uh, come to the Santos Tour Down Under and they've had the winner in the past as well. Just over six kilometres, 3.8 miles to race. Yeah, Kadri is a very good climber. He's made a move like this just as he's got to the top part of the climb, just over the last little bit of the false flat. What he's doing is trying to take the sting away from uh, his team having to do any of the pacemaking because they've also got a very, very good sprinter, the uh, Belarusian champion, Yoeni Hutorovic. 
and he uh, can produce a fine turn of speed. Now, having a rider like AG2R off the front here, it means that his team can sit at the back and leave the other teams to actually do the pacemaking. But when you look at that, he's not really going anywhere. Well, Hujerovic, his teammate, was third on this opening stage last year when we finished in Clare from Prospect. Now we're going to a first-time finish in Lobethal. Legs are aching a little bit now, Rob. He's, he sort of got up there, but now he's cracking a little bit. Well, I'd also hope that there was a bit of communication there that Hutarovic wasn't struggling at the back as his teammate went off the front, which uh, we have often seen to be the case. Not a lot of communication and guys riding as individuals. Yeah. So he's just sitting right at the back of the main field, number 71, Jack Bobridge. He's yeah, moved alongside teams. him is Marcel Kittel. Oh, really? Well, that's not so good either. No. Kittel, again, one of those climbers, one of those sprinters who's not very good at getting over the climbs, and, and that's another reason why we've seen uh, Team Mobby start putting the pressure on. Mm. I'm a bit surprised to see Bobridge riding so far down towards the back. He, he moved across to this Blanco team during the winter. He wants to try and find himself on the road again, but uh, maybe he's not put in as many miles as he should have done during through the winter. Well, I must say that uh, the pressure at the front might have written out of the script one or two sprinters and pushed them to the back of the peloton. That was the plan. And this is uh, Blel Kadri now. He's come over another little rise. He looked round there, he wouldn't have seen the race, but if he looks again, he will, as they now start to chase him down. Well, what's really uh, very interesting in a, in a sport like professional cycling, it's very easy to make the attack, but to actually consolidate on the attack is a lot more difficult. As they go around that corner, they're pretty much onto the back wheel of the Frenchman from AG2R. Got everyone uh, trying to negotiate that corner. In fact, Hutterovic was quite a way down the main field as well. I saw him, he's probably around about 50th position. That means to me that Andre Greipel is riding very well because despite all of this pressure, he held his position in the line behind all of his teammates. That's right, you, like I said, you saw Greipel up there, Goss, Renshaw. I did just notice uh, back there that uh, the team of Argos Shimano had gone back to fetch Marcel Kittel, try and bring him back to the front. They've got a lot of work to do. The problem is dropping back that far on a final climb like we just had. You've got a lot of work to do to come back to the front of that final five or six kilometres. Well, these narrow roads, the constant change of direction, the undulations, it all serves to break up the rhythm of the sprinters. I know in Robbie McEwen's day, he would be in a position now and hiding, right, Robbie? Ready for the, the pounce. I'll be hiding and just still trying to conserve energy, riding the, in the right position, and that's what the best sprinters are doing here. Like uh, I said, Greipel staying with his team. It's all about organisation and, and sticking to the plan that you make before the stage. These guys are so well drilled. I can just see him right through there in the middle behind the Sky Train. Andre does often look like he's labouring a little bit, but I just think it's his muscles are so big it makes him rock a little bit on the bike. He'll be there. The man in red, Edvard Boysenhagen, he packs a great sprint. A couple of years ago, he won two stages of the Tour de France using his sprint. He's now moved up into third place. He's in the red jersey here. Matthew Heyman is setting the pace for him as they continue coming up on the shoulder. The riders of Andre Greipel's team just trying to match Team Sky wheel for wheel here. This is a perfect finish for Edvard Boysenhagen. He knows it too, but he's got a fight, suffer and hold position at the moment. He's in third place and he's out in the wind to the right of our picture. Just seeing Lotto team here. They've still got Greipel in firing position. Sky have got the driving seat just at the moment. And the length of that peloton is pushing other sprinters right to the back of the field. I can see uh, amongst the Sky boys there, they've got uh, CJ Sutton in last position. So it looks like Boss and Hagen will be doing the lead out today for Chris Sutton. Well, let's see if that's the case. It would be nice to see CJ get a win here in the first stage of the Santos Tour down under as we run into the finish in Lobethal. These boys now starting to whip up speeds of over 35 miles an hour, plus uh, almost 60 kilometers now as they snake through the trees heading towards Lobethal. Once they line up to the finish, the actual finish is a sprinter's delight, but it's a tough approach. It's a tough approach, this final few kilometers you saw under the trees, the winding road, Sky in prime position, but Lotto were just waiting for a straight piece of road to come over the top and hit the front like they've done here. Now the Blanco teams, those blue uh, right-sided jerseys down there containing uh, Mark Renshaw and uh, Graham Brown, they're not out of touch by any means if things go right for them at the moment, but they're certainly now Lotto are regaining control, Sky are being pushed back, and Edler Voisenhagen in that red jersey has lost quite a few places here on this way down. And the ones I can't see at the moment is the team of Orica Greenedge and Matt Goss. It's almost time they arrive towards the front, otherwise they're going to leave themselves too much to do. 
We are poised here now. Greipel, 11 stage wins. Last year, he won the opening stage. He's done it before as well. This time, if he wins, he equals Robbie McEwen's uh, record of 12 victories. Robbie watching the pictures alongside me here. And I'm sure sprinting every inch of the way. This is Robbie's first year in retirement. Must be a bit hard, Rob. It's not too bad. I really enjoy watching. I like watching the tactical battles and what guys are doing. And i got to admit, I do look at it and think, what would I be doing now? Where would I be? But uh, it's just really nice to watch. It's a nice little adrenaline rush. Who I do see down mixing it in there, good mate of mine from the Gold Coast, Jonathan Cantwell from the Saxo Tinkoff team. He might deliver the surprise result too. Uh, Jonathan Cantwell is in his second year with that team. He got his first Tour de France last year. Top 10 finishes on the big stages of the Tour. Sky are now a little bit of disarray. There's a sudden rush to try and get Mark Renshaw up now as the riders from the Blanco team move up. But they've left it a bit late now and everybody else is dropping out of it. I've just seen Matt Goss back in about 18th position trying to make his way to the front, but he has got a long, a long chase ahead of him. A thousand metres to go, that's all it is now. Shortly they'll be swinging into the streets of Lobethal. If they're outside the top 20, they'll never make the progress required. Now these are the domestics uh, making the final flings to try and lead their sprinters to the line first. Once we make that long straight approach, the sprinters will see the finishing banner. And at the moment, we have to say it is advantage Lotto Bellasol because they have the man right in position. Steel Van Hoff is moving up in the blue jersey as well. Boysenhagen has recovered completely in the red jersey. He's sitting in the fifth or sixth place in a perfect position. He's trying to move up on the outside as well there now. It looks as though we have also uh, um, Eros Kopecki is trying to get in. Now they're lining up for the finish. It is now the lead out and it has to be Greg Henderson who leads it out. It's all too familiar as Greipel goes for win number 12 historically. Look at the distance here as he roars clear. Hucherovic looks to be in second place. Greipel joins Robin McCoon with 12 historic wins. I think it will be Hucherovic who has taken second Second place, one better than one year ago in Clare. But Robbie, there is no stopping that man. He didn't win by half a wheel, did he? No, he won by half the street. Uh, it was never in doubt from the moment he put power to the pedals. He rode the rest of the guys out of the wheel. His team worked to perfection. They took control at the right time. And when Andre you know, puts the power down, you've got to be on your game, not only to beat him, but just to go with him. And you saw the other guys seem to be at their maximum when the sprint started. It was all over. And it wasn't an easy approach. They really did hit him hard they could, but the team got control when it mattered. Greg Henderson, as always, looking after him and then launching him. And look at that. You'll see a late run coming from a rider in the white jersey, and that will be uh, Johini Hutrovic, who has got second place on the day, I think. No, it's an FDJ rider who has come over there. So oh, that will be Arno oh, no, Demar, Demar. Yeah. who has got second place, the Frenchman. Very good young rider. Won a stage in the Tour of Qatar last year, and it's escaping with the moment, but he won something very big at the end of last season. He's a great talent. Also, uh, under-23 world champion from in Copenhagen two years ago. And now developing into being a top pro, a second place finish on a world tour stage. Mark Renshaw coming in there in third place. I saw Boissenhagen got himself on the wrong side of Steel van Hoff, got closed against the barriers and his chance of a good result went down the toilet. Well, two races in 2013, two wins now for Andre Greiber. Remember, he won the People's Choice race in Adelaide on Sunday, which is not part of this event. All the same riders, of course. And now he's done exactly what he did a year ago, uh, backed up with a win in the first day of the Santos Tour Down Under. So let's see if we can show you now the stage results. And there they are, Greipel over Arno Demar. That's a good result for the French. And Renshaw gets third. Simone Ponzi of Astana, but he's Italian in fourth. Steel Van Hoff, you weren't far away, Robbie, with your choice. He got fifth place. Ferrari in sixth for Lamprey. Pietro Poli getting seventh. Boysenhagen won't be too pleased with eighth place. Rockas won't be pleased with ninth either. And Zach Dempster uh, completing the top ten there. Now, there, as we look down on the main street here in Lobethal, the riders are now getting ready for the prize presentation. A familiar thing, Robbie. Now, he's joined you, mate. He's got 12 wins as well as you. 
and congratulations to him. He deserves every single one of them. He's been the, the dominant rider in the Tour Down Under over the last few years. Now, this is how it stands overall. The time bonus is taken into account. Greipel keeps uh, the lead. He'll be the Oka jersey tomorrow. Demar is at four seconds. Renshaw at six. Gerrans, because of that sprint out on the course, you see, is in fourth place alongside the world champion, Philippe Gilbert. Thomas de Gens scored out on course. He's sixth along with uh, Jerome Pinot. Uh, also out there, Ponzi, Rocas and Impey. It looks as though Jordan Kirby lost a little bit of time because his bonuses haven't kept him in the top ten overall. Well, it's going to be a very, very familiar sight tomorrow with Andre Greipel in the leader's jersey. But tomorrow we go up corkscrew, so it'll be a pretty short-lived stint, I'd say. Well, I think we can now go down to Paul Sherman, who's left our side, and he's probably with Andre Greipel. You're quite right there, uh, Andre, just as it was on Sunday night and it was 12 months ago, you win the Classic and you win the opening stage. Yeah. I mean, uh, we expected a really tough final. Uh, we expected a bit more, more attacks, but uh, yeah, the team did an awesome job again. In the beginning, Oli Kaisen was pulling to get the breakaway, control the bunch, and uh, yeah, I think the guys did an awesome job again. It was really hard to control, to keep me up in the front. Uh, I could get out of trouble until the finish. And uh, yeah, I think everybody did an awesome job to, to do the lead out. A lot of the other sprinters were put into difficulty on that final climb with about five, six kilometers to go. And uh, some of them slipped right to the back end of the main field. You looked solid up at the front with your team. Yeah, we knew that uh, there's a bit of a crosswind on the climbs and uh, we decided to try and stay in the front. Everybody kept us in, uh, out of the wind. Uh, Tim Wellens was put lead out train and uh, with Seabag Roland, Henderson, I think uh, I have the best guys on my side. There was a lot of challenges to, the, to your team leader, a little bit of chaos, but eventually you got it all back together just as you did uh, in the Tour de France last year. Oh, uh, yeah, well, we knew when it's a bit warm and hot, uh, it, it's hard to keep the space, the, the pace in front. And uh, yeah, we, we just tried to save some energy for the final because we knew it will be really hot. Yeah, and I think uh, we stick to the plan again. Thank you. Well done, Andre Grappel. He's now got uh, 98 wins, uh, and he's not far away from getting 100, and it could well happen in the remaining five days of the Santos Tour Down Under. Presentations are not far away. This is Channel 9's Wide World of Sports. It's been a wonderful day here in the Adelaide Hills. And Andre Greipel, known as the Gorilla, he's made a 12 stage wins now, equaling our own Robbie McEwen. And he joins us, Robbie and Phil. Let's have a look at those highlights because it was quite a race, wasn't it? It was a great finish indeed, wasn't it, Robbie? And a sprinter's delight as we saw in the end. Let's just take a look here. This was the start back in Prospect around about four hours plus ago. Lovely blue skies and the riders immediately under pressure by one youngster from Queensland. A great move by the youngster, wasn't it, Rob? This is Checker Hill here where Jordan Kirby got the points. That was a fantastic move by a young rider, under-23 Australian champion, but the bunch has learnt not to let UniSA riders <laughs> get too far in front. No, they closed in on him. He went through Charleston and got the three-second tie bonus there, but Jens Voigt started the reaction from the field. A little bit of a surprise in second place on the first visit to Charleston. Simon Gerrans getting a couple of seconds time bonus. He is the defending champion in this event. But again, heading for Charleston once more, it was still Jordan Kirby out in front and a good tussle. This was a good tussle. And Thomas de Gent of Belgium getting the two-second time bonus. All the riders here know how vitally important it is to take some bonus seconds if they want to ride for GC. Simon Guerin knows it better than anybody else. Equal time last year, every second counts. But a counter-attack coming as we headed towards Woodside and in just leaving Woodside, it was here where Jerome Pino caught Jordan Kirby, sent him back to the peloton and he was now setting the pace. In pursuit was a bunch around about a minute behind. 
I love this move from the world champion, Philip Gilbert. Pure class. And this is why the guy is world champion. You think Pino has got it? Oops. I tell you, Philip I can't Gilbert. ever remember seeing that before. He catches him about three metres from the line and gets the three-second time bonus. Could prove valuable by the end of this week. And then the field coming together, and so it's a bunch sprint. And this is when Robin McEwen always used to win, but now we have to say this is when Andre Greipel always wins. Off you go, oh, Robbie. Look at when he puts the power to the pedals. The rest just, they almost drown in his wake. It is very impressive to see. It was a one-man show. He's won by half the street. Yeah, he did it last year. Andre Greipel, the air, uh, the arms punched in the air. Paul just did the interview. Pretty happy guy. He's won, uh, of course, the Classic. He's won the first stage. He did that last year, and they're getting ready for the podium. So we'll take a break and be back to get that ochre jersey on the big guy. They really are exquisite pitches, aren't they? A bluebird day here in the Adelaide Hills. We've seen some wonderful cycling and uh, the pitches matching the performance. Andre Greipel, absolutely outstanding. He won this first stage of the Santos Tour down under last year. Today, making history, and it was his 12th stage when he equals Robbie McEwen, of course, as the most stage winning cyclist, if you can say that, if that makes correct English at all. It so. makes absolute sense to me, uh, Tim, and it's a great win for him because, you know, he's now won 98 races as a pro and we could see him get his 100th in the next few days. But he won't get it tomorrow, I'll guarantee that. Not with the Corkscrew Hill uh, <laughs> seven k's from the finish. I think we're going to have another exciting day tomorrow because I'll tell you one thing, uh, that climb, Corkscrew Hill, at seven kilometres, five miles to go to the finish, that's going to change the face of the overall standings and I would be very, very surprised if Andre Greipel is still in the lead tomorrow. Anything jump at you today? Any, any, any big surprises? Of course, Jordan Kirby was outstanding, the young guy. Yes, of course. Hang on, let's go down because there he is. He's just been introduced on stage and uh, salutes the crowd. A carbon copy of 48 hours ago when he was in Rymel Cork winning the People's Choice race. Now he is winning the opening stage of the Santos Tour Down Under. Well, Phil is a carbon copy of 12 months ago as well because he won the <laughs> opening classic and he won the opening stage. He is faster than anybody else in this bike race. They're going to go back to the drawing board tonight and try and figure out how can we beat this man in the sprints? Well, uh, His teammates really worked for him, didn't they? Well, look at this. The, uh, he, he was launched uh, at the finishing line by Greg Henderson. He won by lengths, as Robbie McEwen said at the time, by half a street. Uh, and he won it easily. Let's have a look at the stage results then. Uh, and the small bonuses for the men that take the top three places. Greipel, Arno Damar, a real promising young Frenchman he is. Mark Renshaw breaking in there, the Australian third. Ponzi, the uh, Italian on the uh, Kazakh team, he gets four, Ponzi. Uh, Von Hoff wasn't far away, Robbie's choice, him fifth. Looking further down the list, Eddie Boisenhagen, the points winner last year, won't be happy with the eighth place finish there. Let's see the presentation. Now in this race, the Tour de France, it's yellow. In the Santos Tour down under, it is an ochre jersey for the race leader. Andre Greipel gets to wear it tomorrow. He's no stranger, but I think if we want to take something away from today's stage, uh, what about that move by the world champion who went out and got himself a three-second time bonus out on the course? And with Corkscrew Hill coming down towards the end of tomorrow's race, we're in for a humdinger. Yeah, that was my cousin Philippe Gilbert. He was outstanding. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it's not a long way tomorrow. It's only 116 kilometres. The day was 135. And with that crucial hill with seven kilometres to go, we should see a full day of attacking riding to try and negate that climb up the corkscrew. Overall results, of course, after stage one of the Santos Tour Down Under, the L'Oreal Men Expert stage one. Now, this is what you see. This is why they went for those small time bonuses. There are timed gaps now. Greipel, four seconds on Demar, Renshaw. Gilbert, who won out on the course, got a bonus. He's up in fourth. Guerin's the same. He's up in fifth. And then looking further down, as Stuart O'Grady completing the top men. So they have done extremely well to snatch those few seconds. The next obvious leader of this race for me, Paul, Gilbert or Gerrans? Absolutely. Uh, we've seen that Philippe Gilbert has got the form and that was a very crafty move, a very clever move to get himself the three seconds mm. time bonus. And I think he's come to this race. He's playing down his... We've seen the poker game. He's playing down his chances. Oh, maybe I'll get into the top ten. I might try and get myself onto the podium. I think he wants to win. Yeah, no question. And it's great to see Stuart O'Grady's name there on uh, the yeah. top ten. Aye. All right. We go from here to tomorrow, and of course it's very, very different. We can guarantee that Andre Greipel will not win tomorrow. 
No, he can't win tomorrow. As much as he would love Andre to climb a hill like the corkscrew, some of the riders might even find themselves walking up it. It's very, very steep. And once over the top, seven kilometers, and you fly to the finishing line. If you lose ground going up, you're not going to get it back on the way down. Yeah, talking to the race organiser, Mike Turter, just last night, he said uh, it's not going to be a bunch, but it's not going to be 30 or 40 riders. It might only be 10 riders left together at the top of Corkscrew Hill. And I think we're going to see a real battle. The first indication of who wants to win this bike race overall will come tomorrow. I cannot wait for it, Paul. Phil, wonderful commentary as always today. Stage one of the Santos Tour Down Under is run, and tomorrow it is stage two. Corkscrew Hill, 7Ks from the finish. It's going to be wonderful. Now, check those highlights tonight, of course, on Channel 9 if you want a full run-through of what happened today. Tomorrow we are live again on Gem. We have the highlights tomorrow night. You can check our website and uh, get a full dose of the Santos Tour Down Under. We're having a feast of cycling here. We'll see you soon on Channel 9's Wide World of Sports. Thank <laughs> you.